What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the best podcast in the universe. It's mind pump time. All right, uh, here's the giveaway for today's episode. MAPS suspension. So suspension training is phenomenal for stability, strength, balance. You can actually build a lot of muscle if you do it the right way. And of course, MAPS suspension is the right way to do it. And you can win that program for free, but you got to do this, okay? You got to leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode, subscribe to this channel, and turn on your notifications. Do all those things, and if we like your comment, what we'll do is we'll notify you, and you'll get free access to MAPS Suspension. One more thing before we get started with this excellent, amazing, and beautiful, and sexy podcast. It's all those things, by the way. Uh, we have three workout bundles we've put together for the month of January, discounted heavily. Each bundle includes multiple workout programs and essentially gives you nine months of planned out workouts. So for nine months, you know how many sets, how many reps, what exercises. You got video demos, blueprints, phasing, the whole thing. Okay, it's all in there in each bundle. But here's what they are. We have one for beginners, one for people who are intermediate, and one for people who are advanced. So we have a bundle that's right for everybody. If you're interested, head over to mapsjanuary.com, click on the bundle you want, and sign up. And again, don't forget they're all discounted heavily. One more thing, if you just want to try one MAPS program, you, you don't want to commit to a long period of time, you just want to try one, see what it's all about, do MAPS Anabolic. That's the foundational MAPS program. That one right now is half off. It's 50% off. So if you just want to do that, go to mapsred.com and then add the code January50 for that half off discount. All right, here comes the show. Look, for long-term fat loss success, walking is superior to running. All right. Ooh, I like yeah, that. I know. I like that a lot. I had people's heads just spun yeah. right now when I said that. Here well, we you go, go, cardio people. I like that because it's also um, it's the opposite of what I thought and said to clients for the first probably five plus years of being ten a trainer. years for me. Yeah, maybe ten. Easily. Maybe ten. I was trying yeah. to be nice to myself. Maybe I was thinking five to eight somewhere <laughs> in there, but really it might have been ten. And you know, I, I've shared on the podcast that you know clients would fill out that form the park queue right and they and one of the questions in there was always you know what do you do for a form of exercise right now and inevitably at least one of every three people would say oh well my husband and i we walk every yeah, day and you'd scoff i would Same. i would i would You're totally like breaking a sweat you know? I, I would totally say that they oh it's minimal amount of calories we're burning and that's insignificant to what we need to do if we mm -hmm. want to lose 20 pounds and would totally like shit all, all over their walking now the irony in that is Fast forward, you know, 20 years or 15 years later from that, uh, me coaching somebody now and they and they come in and they say, Adam, I'm, I'm not doing anything really and I want to lose all this weight and I want this, that, that. I'm willing to come in seven days a week. I, the, the stuff that I tell them now is like, okay, all I want you to do is start with walking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like... The exact opposite of how I thought, uh, you know, 20 years yeah. ago. So let's be clear. First, let's put aside the performance effects of exercise. Obviously, if you're looking for stamina and endurance, athletic performance, running is going to be better. So let's put that aside for a second. What are the, what are the, one of the, I guess, pluses or advantages of running over walking is it burns more calories per time being spent. This is totally true. So if you do 30 minutes of walking versus 30 minutes of running, you will burn more calories running. Okay. But that's where the pros end. Here are the negatives. Most people don't know how to run. And I don't mean most people can't run. I mean, most people don't run properly. It's a skill. And most people stop running right around the age of 12 or at the latest, maybe when they pl stop playing college sports. And so they decide they, you know, lace up my running shoes. I'm going to go start going running now. It's been, you know, 10, 15, 20 years since I ran. And their form and technique is off. They have muscle imbalances and, uh, and just issues with their technique and form. Mm -hmm. And add to that, people run not to learn how to run or to run well, but rather they run to fatigue when they decide to go running. So one of the worst things you could do for your form and technique, if it's already bad, is to do it to fatigue. And it's no wonder why running is the number one form of activity uh, in relationship to injuries. It's the most it, – you will produce the most injuries – with running versus yeah, you other run forms flat of footed, you have bad form. Like this is going to impact your joints way more than people realize. Yes, and it's just like re that repetitive stress. It really adds up, especially if over time, you know, you're you got to consider like arthritis and things that are going to come as a result of that. Yeah. Now, in contrast, most people have not forgotten how to walk. Most people still walk every single day. We haven't become Wally yet, so maybe 20 years from now, it'll be different. But people still walk. So if someone goes to walk for activity. We're not so worried about form, technique, you know, balance, muscle imbalances. You can walk because you walk all the time. So there's that right there. Here's the second con of running. You typically need to change your workout clothes or put on some workout clothes. You're going to sweat. 
It's not something you could just do in the middle of the day and then go to a meeting because it's not as convenient. Um, walking is extremely convenient. I can do it any time of the day. Don't need to change my clothes. I go out, I go for a walk, I come back. Super easy. So it's far easier to inject into your everyday life. And this plays a huge role in long-term consistency. This is by far the biggest, uh, I would say the most impactful factor with consistency is how easy can I inject this into my everyday life? And it's easy to do a 10 to 15 minute walk after breakfast, lunch, and dinner, which could come out to 30 to 45 minutes of extra activity. Not as easy to go do a 15 minute run after breakfast, lunch, and dinner, especially if you're at work or you got other obligations. Well, it, it's very much so uh, what is it, Aesop's Fables, right? That's mm. uh, Tortoise and the Hare. Isn't that, where, yeah. that came, isn't that mm. where it came from? It is. Right? So it, it's very much so that, right? Like uh, the rabbit comes out and gets way ahead of the turtle, but what ends up happening, the turtle wins the race, right, to ruin the- He burns himself out. Right? And so I, I just think that that applies to real life uh, uh, many times. And that it's not just- with cardio and exercise, I think a lot of times we 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 ride off that the motivation and the the energy and the hype, mm-hmm. and we make our short term decision based off of that current state that we're in. And you know, theoretically, yeah, I'm going to run three or four yeah. days a week or every day, and that's going to get me to my goal. And maybe the first couple of weeks you stick to it, but then life hits you, and then the sustainability of that is just unrealistic. Aside from all the points you bring up too, yeah. which is the injuries and all, and how inconvenient it is. But it just it's not sustainable for the no. average person. And I know by the way, every time we do something like this where we talk about running, we always piss off a, you know, fraction of the audience. And the fraction of the audience that we always piss off are the people that love to run. And I'm who not, run well. I'm not speaking to you. Yes. Yeah. So I, I just want to make that clear that if you enjoy running and it's therapeutic for you and you're a good runner with good mechanics and you don't, you're not suffering from chronic pain and it's meditative for you and you're, and you've been consistently, I ain't talking to you. Keep doing it. Yep. I'm all, if I got a client, if I, you hired me and you said that to me, I would not say stop running. No, we're I wouldn't work with what you got. Yeah. I wouldn't tell a client that, No. but if I have a client who comes in, who is not doing anything for exercise and they want to lose weight, I am not going to suggest that to that no, person. No. That is not a, I, I don't think it is a smart strategy for over 90% of the population. No, and it's so, not a long term strategy. It requires a lot of effort, work, and coaching to get good at running if you're not somebody that's been running since you were a child, which is essentially what's required to maintain the skill. Now, to be clear, humans did evolve to run. And we're amazing runners when done properly, but we lose that skill and nobody treats it like a skill. Like I know very little, very few people. We we also evolved to throw a spear. Right. Exactly. (laughs) How many fucking people can throw a spear? Exactly. So I know, I know a very (laughs) few people who decide I'm going to go running and then say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to really practice running. I'm going to hire a coach. I'm going to learn how to run properly. I'm going to look at my biomechanics. Nobody does that. They say, I'm going to start running to work out, lace up their shoes and they go run until they're tired. And the entire time, especially as fatigue sets in, technique and form is absolutely terrible. I remember when this first really uh, hit me. I was going hiking, and I saw runner after runner pass me up. And you know, I'm, I'm a trainer, so it's hard for me not to notice biomechanics. And as people pass by, I'm like, oh, my God, pronation. Whoa, really bad supination. Anterior pelvic tilt. Oh, my God, his shoulders are forward. Oh, I could see all these injuries. And then there was the rare runner who ran by me that looked like a gazelle like they looked like they they were running perfectly and it mm-hmm. looked flawless and painless and it dawned on me like that's a skill just like any other skill and unless you're going to treat it like a skill which by the way there's a there's a long learning curve if you haven't run consistently well for years it's going to take you a good year of practice of skill acquisition of correcting muscle imbalances and mobility work and all that stuff to be able to do it Walking doesn't have that walk that that learning. Your average curve. person can't even sit with good posture. Yes, totally. <laughs> it's it's what are we talking about? You know, now we got to like get out there and run and do something like super strenuous like that when I can't even hold myself in good posture. Yep. So it's you just have to consider what the very average person, your everyday average person, really looks like in their daily habits and and rituals. And so that's why we're speaking more in that direction. Yeah, and and the problem is when people make the comparison. They're not using uh, realistic real-world context. So when they do the comparison, they say, running for 30 minutes builds this much VO2 max, burns this many calories. Walking for 30 minutes does this and burns this many fewer calories. Therefore, running is better. 
But when you look at real world context, uh, injury risk, um, you know, how long it takes to build the skill of what you're trying to do, how easy it is to inject into your daily life, what, it, how long people tend to stay consistent doing each activity. When you all add all of that up, which is the real world, because the other stuff doesn't matter. It's what actually happens in the real world. Walking is superior. When I got clients to walk instead of encouraging people to run, which is what I did early on, yeah. people got way better results because they didn't hurt themselves. They were consistent and it was easy. It's easy. Something like, you can build on. To, I could, we, we could pause the podcast right now. I could go for a 15 minute walk, come back and I'm okay. If I go for a 15 minute run and I come back, I gotta, I'm got i sweating, maybe breathing. I'm, it's not appropriate to do throughout the day for most people. So To me, that's the, be the best argument is that is the, is the consistency piece. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The end, you know, scaring somebody about injuries and there's going to be always a percentage of people that's like, oh, I don't have any pain when I run. I feel just fine. Or, well, but I'll just go do the elliptical or the Stairmaster and that doesn't bother me. But the idea of selling somebody on building walks into their into their lifestyle, I think, is just more realistic to maintain that long term. And to your point, Justin, it's very easy to kind of scale up. I would always start off with yep. this, hey, go for a 30-minute walk with there. you and your spouse after dinner every night is a great. And what ends up happening is they start to do something, and they they like that. And it's like, yeah. oh, this becomes a part of my routine now. To Sal's point, mm -hmm. I don't got to change now my I clothes. Hike. I want to do something a little more intense. Yeah, maybe and on the weekends, and I start to extend those those walks to two-hour hikes where we go somewhere mm -hmm. and uh, somewhere beautiful and, 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 and get more calories burned. But it's really just it's it's changing the lifestyle, and I think that was in the behaviors yeah. around that. So yep. I think that's the and thing. And when you add all that up, you get a greater real world fat loss effect from walking and better health effect from walking. Um, you're still, of course, with running, you're going to build more endurance, more stamina, more athletic performance, which is fine if that's what you're looking for. But most people are like, look, I just want to be fit and healthy. I definitely want to have improved fitness and performance, but I'm not looking to go too crazy. I want to be lean. I want to have good health. I don't want to have any pain. And when you look at it in that through that lens, walking is just so so amazing. And also, by the way, when you look at the longest living people in the world, what they all have in common, there's a few things that they have in common, but one of them is just daily activity. It's not even daily hardcore activity. It's just daily yeah. Activity. It's the 90 year old fisherman in Sardinia that, you know, goes out on his boat and fishes and walks, you know, and walks up the the, the hill to get the yeah, berries. The, the and that farmer kind of that works their land, you know. Yes, it's that kind of stuff. So this is what you need to consider. And it's important to consider all of this when you're looking to improve your fitness. Look at your goals and say, what's realistic? What's actually going to stick? Because, uh, you know, you might burn 25% less calories walking, but if you walk consistently every single day, versus a spotty record with running, it's going to be more effective. And that's just uh, the bottom line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I want to ask you, Adam, I know your son's uh, about a year older than mine or so. Is it, Are you seeing, because you always tell me how like he's the easiest kid in the world. Are you seeing any signs of the terrible twos? So or? actually, it's funny you bring that up because uh, you didn't know this. I didn't say anything to you. Uh, yesterday, he's, he's so he got the flu, right? The last like four or five days poor Katrina when we were off in Utah she gets stuck with him being sick and he was this was probably the one of the uh, sickest right he was grabbing his tummy and oh help me yeah, he just, yeah help poor me kid. is one of the things he says right now which oh, just breaks yeah the, help me. It's like, yeah it's one of the first pair which is so cute because you'll hear him last night I was I was putting him down and you know, he got up after I walked out, and I told you guys we have the kind of door lock on that. And he, he hears the door, and you hear him, whoa, help me, oh. help me. <laughs> it's like, oh, dude, it's so dirty. <laughs> like, <laughs> but uh, anyways, Katrina said that, um, she goes, uh, you missed the the craziest breakdown uh, Ma I've ever seen Max have, and it was going to the doctor. She goes, as soon as we got out of the, she goes, he threw a fit. She goes, he did not want to be in there, like, so obviously he's now reached an age where he's probably, and what I assume associating is- Associating it with shots or yes, something? Yes, yeah. that's what I think he's- He's, he's got to buy him something afterwards. So- so <laughs> It worked on me when But I was she little. said it was- yeah, She goes, uh, she walked in and, and uh, Dr. Traeger is our pediatrician and she goes, uh, Dr. Traeger, I don't, is this what, the, what everybody talks about? Uh, tantrums and stuff? Because we've experienced nothing like this, what he's acting like and- and uh, he's like, yeah, no, just feel blessed that you don't deal with this a lot more. And he goes, she goes, yeah, I've never seen him like this. So that was the the only thing that she and I haven't seen it yet. So I haven't seen it. I've told you guys before. I don't know if I've shared on the podcast um, his you know tantrum thing that he does. It's the funniest thing in the world. He, which you know, I know most parents are going like, fuck you. It's not funny when my kid throws a tantrum. But when Max does it, 
he like like if I he doesn't get his way like oh we have to put this away right now or we're gonna do this or no we're not gonna do that right now if I tell him and he's upset or would you would typically throw it at him he lays down on the ground and he puts his face down and he taps his fingers on the ground and he and he does this like slow kick and he goes <laughs> <laughs> and he's faking it and it's not loud he's just making you feel better oh my god it's that's a, way I, more effective oh it's so hilarious I think your son's a closer yeah he, you know he probably is but takes after his parents yeah I know he's been he's been um you know we we were all together right and we were talking to um brooke's husband about you know raising a kid and we're all sharing stories and they, uh, they've had a really hard time right the kids had a lot of stuff that they've had to deal with and i always feel bad in those conversations on do i just keep my mouth shut and don't contribute and not be the one parent right you don't want to be the, nobody likes the guy who's just yeah. like oh my kid's so perfect really right? yeah he's right? eight no hours problem. Yeah, yeah so i just kind of keep my mouth shut in a situation like that cuz i don't want to be that asshole but the truth is you Dude, know kids are so different like yeah, I, are, I have totally my different. two older kids my oldest really didn't throw tantrums i mean you know here and there but not often at all my yeah. daughter she would throw tantrums that I swear to God, if you could hook her up to cables, you would power a city. Like that's how much energy wow. output she would have. Oh yeah, with her tantrums. Yeah, my young she was way younger. more explosive if if it was going to happen. You know, he, the very few times, but when he did, you knew. Like everybody knew. Yeah. Like he was upset. They're just big feelings, <laughs> now, right? Yeah. Now how a much big, a big uh, emotional guy? You guys are both way ahead of me in this in this in this area, right? So how much of that, and you, Doug, included, because you've been there too. How much do you guys contribute uh, to nature versus nurture in that situation? Like, how much is Everett being that way, Justin? Because uh, it's in his DNA. He's more like his dad, where he gets he he has he blows his top when There's he gets upset. There. Yeah. And how much is that? You know, maybe that kid. I think it's a lot of nurture, a lot of nature, because I have they all raised in the same house, very he, similar, Courtney, very different. Yeah. Courtney and I are very chill about a lot of like how we handle a lot of those situations, try not to stoke it or like, you know, make a big deal. We really try not to make a big deal out of these outbursts. So yeah. it's not like I'm fueling it. Yeah. And that's why it doesn't happen all the time. But like, yeah, I definitely think it's partially part of my, you know, DNA in there because I would have like explosive reactions yeah. when I was a kid because I, I suffered through like a lot of anger issues and things. And it's like a bummer because it's like, where where is that? Like, what am I contributing that that's causing like the anger? You know, in him, I don't know that I have. Yeah, I really can't. Yeah, like, well, well, pin it my, down. I have three siblings, and we were all pretty different with that. My brother was the one that he would if he threw a tantrum, it was like it was over. But as an adult and as a teenager, it totally switched. He was like the happiest, and he's like that now as a, as a grown man. He's always smiling, always happy, always in a good mood. I never, I wasn't a ten, temper tantrum uh, type of person. My other sister was very much. My other sister wasn't. With my kids, the older ones, very different. Aurelius is interesting. He's only, you know, he's, he's what is he, 15 months almost now? And I, we're seeing little hints of mm. it. Like he'll get really mad. And if he's not getting what he wants or he's not getting his attention, he'll take whatever's in front of him. So if it's food or whatever, and he'll throw it and just to get your attention. All right, and he'll look right at you when he does it. He'll look at me, yeah, yeah. hold it, and fling it. And yeah. I'll be like, oh, just okay. Defiance. Here we go, yeah. buddy. <laughs> or if I'm like playing with him and he wants to go down and, and I'm still kissing him and I don't want to put him down yet, he'll grab my face and he does this like where he squeezes real hard, Arr, you know, does this thing. And, See, I'll so like, even, and I'll be like, ow. And then you'll feel bad. Even though, the, even though you guys, like the kids grew up in the same house, I always wonder though, like, and I'm like, and how aware are we of like these little subtle moments? I'll give you an example of something that just happened like three days ago or whatever. Um, and, and it, I think these occasions have been so rare for Katrina and I that it, it, that it's so obvious to us when they have it. So Katrina and I, like we never fight in front of them. That's what, that's never going down. Well, her and I don't really fight anyways, but even like, even the way the tone and the stuff we talk, sure. like if, if there's any sort of, I told you guys that one time mm -hmm. where there was kind of this like business kind of heated conversation we had, we weren't yelling, we weren't arguing, but the energy was, you know, me going no. And like talking that way, it was enough to throw him off. So she just had a, a, another a situation like this where she was talking to her brother on the phone and she got really she got really mad at him. She was actually stepped out of the room and she was like yelling and they were getting back and forth. And she said it was very short lived because she heard Max start crying in the other room. Oh, yeah. And so she cut mm -hmm. the phone off. So what I'm saying is that 
you know, do you guys have the, can you remember, or did you have the awareness of, you know, maybe when one kid was going through that, it was a, a tough time for your parents, like financially, or they were maybe arguing, like maybe they weren't vocalizing it so much, but it was, they, they, they were going the, the through something. There. There's, right. There's or like, definitely, there's definitely a, there, there's a, probably, there's always a nurture that. component, but if the best studies to look at with that are twin studies. Because twin studies, you have identical genetics. And they're going through the same time. Yeah, and very similar. And right. so twin studies can tell you quite a bit. And twin studies show that there's definitely a strong genetic component to temperament. Now, nurture plays a role, of course. But there's, there's clearly a genetic component. The argument is which one is more impactful. I think if the nurture is extreme, that's more impactful. For example... You could have great genetics for temperament, but then be brought up in an abusive household. Like right. a now the nurture really- Or never take, receive love. Or never receive love, right? Now right. that makes a bigger role. So it, I don't think, you can't give a clear, you just know that they both influence. And then when you have multiple kids, it's really interesting to see the differences between them. What, you know, what one is interested in, what the other one is interested in, how they are. Like my older ones are very different when it comes to, my daughter's hyper competitive, super ambitious. Super ambitious, hyper competitive. My oldest, not so much, but things tend to come easy to him. So he does well because he's a smart kid, but he's not like my daughter where my daughter's like, I have to be number one. And if mm -hmm. I'm not number one, I'm the loser. And she's like, she'll be upset if she gets one wrong on a test. So I'm like, I talk to them very differently. Like I kick my boy in the butt and I pull her back because mm -hmm. she's such, and that's definitely, uh, that's gotta be something genetic, a hundred percent. Cause they're so different. Right? right. No, I mean, I, I, we know that it's both, right? Yeah. I just always wonder like how much of that. And I think a lot of times people sometimes just automatically, Oh, that's just how they were born, but they're just not even aware of the, 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 the energy that you as mom and dad had at that time. You always consider and that. I think I, when I see these little moments like that, if that's, that's so subtle, it's not yeah. Katrina and I are happy and good, but just the fact that she was on a phone call, where she was angry. So it makes me go like, man, well, maybe the mom and dad don't fight a lot, but maybe uh, the mom or the dad is very high energy and has a lot of hard conversations. Or maybe on, she had a stressful pregnancy with right, her. That. Right, right. Who or, knows? Or, yeah. just, or maybe the, the, the mom or the dad is battling something internally. And I just, I've said this since the very beginning with Max is that, you know, I really believe, especially those early years when the kids can't really communicate or articulate their feelings, that they're hypersensitive when it comes to like energy around uh, the room, just mm -hmm. can feel that. And so maybe even if they're not vocalizing or, you know, not giving the kid love, it's mm -hmm. not like an extreme nature thing, but it's enough that there's something going on internally in the household whether it be an individual or combined, that's actually bleeding into how the behavior of, of the kid, you know? Oh, yeah, I guess course. it's all uh, how we were programmed, huh? Because this is a simulation anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 You know what yeah. sucks about that? That uh, is that if we dude. were, in fact, programmed, we would think that we weren't. We oh, would think that we have free will. That that's why thing. it's so mind -bending. I hate that. I hate that game. Well, did you see that article about the universe potentially like being pixelated yes okay so i what did do you, what do you mean by that it was one? really hard for me to understand it, where they're coming from with okay this. so if you look at a computer image or game and you shrink it down enough you notice there's pixels right yeah there's pixels yeah. and they're all the same size right and those pixels ultimately make up a picture which makes up or whatever right there's evidence that the universe is also this way at a just much smaller uh smart much smaller level there's something what? called plank length i think it's called doug maybe you can look this up this is the smallest unit of measurement and everything is made up of this particular plank length and nothing is made up of anything smaller mm. than this. So when you add that to things like cosmic rays that seem to travel on a lattice, so they also seem to travel in this kind of pre-programmed set thing and then there's rules in the universe like yeah. speeds of light and well they're trying to like talk about gravity too being like completely different like the further out you go in space. Oh, dude, like it literally sounds like like a computer game. It, it does. really does. It's almost like Tron nailed it. Yes. So, I mean, so the, within the metaverse is like the computer within the computer type of deal. Is that what? Well, think about it this yeah, way. We're or are we, are we, are we reverse exists. engineering it? Or know? maybe we're creating <laughs> another one. We don't even realize it. Yeah. See, what is this? This is this uh, plank length is believed by physicists to be the shortest possible length in the universe. So it's like a, it's like, these are like cosmic rules that are very similar to when you program a computer or a game. The the one for me that always trips me out is the whole um, the observer effect when it oh, comes yeah. to particles. Yeah, and it makes me think of like a video game when you're playing a game 
and you're walking through a level. Yeah, it just slowly reveals itself. Yes, to you. but if you're not in that but level, it wasn't there. It's in the whole game. Otherwise, yes. It's so <laughs> it's just mind bending. But if you think, okay, so here's what's really trippy, right? If we follow our trajectory, at some point, humans will create um, realities that are, for all intents and purposes you won't be able to perceive the difference from that reality to this reality. We'll create realities that are essentially identical to this one. And the goal is, or will be, to create sentient artificial life or life that believes, that has its own consciousness, that uh, has its own beliefs, have its own free will and that kind of stuff. So if that's our direction, which it seems to be, yeah. and if life, if the universe is as old as they say it is, then life has existed on Earth, and if intelligent life's goal is to do what we do, then they've already done it. Yeah. So we may be well, I feel like in we, like the tenth level, yeah. or why are we all level. wired to try and create something that has its own uh, intelligence? I don't know, dude. It's just this weird thought. It's like, why were we so focused on uh, making that a reality? Have you ever watched? Do you guys ever watch the? Um, I love this freaking animated show because it's it's for adults and it's they. The, the physics in it and the science in it is actually kind of weird and accurate. You guys ever watch Rick and Morty? Mm -hmm. I've watched a few. Oh, my God. I love it. So there's this one episode where they go to this, like, arcade in, like, this weird planet in this universe, and there's a video game called Life, I think it's called, <laughs> and he plugs into it, and he literally, he's born, and then he, like, goes to school, and he's getting bullied, and then he, like, he meets the love of his life, and then he has children, and then he gets cancer, but then he beats it, and then his wife dies, and then he sees his grandkids, and then he's on his deathbed, and he's, like, looking at his kids, his grandkids and his great-grandkids. He's like, this has been a really great life, and then he wakes up, and the game's over, and he's like, what the fuck, man? Oh, what the hell? Whoa, whoa, where am I? 55 what the years. Hell? Not bad, Morty. You, you kind of wasted your 30s, though, with that whole bird-watching phase. Where, where's my wife? Morty, you were just playing a game. It's called Roy. Snap out of it. Come on. I'm... That's not real? And he goes, <laughs> no. He, he's like, you've been, you've been playing for like two minutes. He's like, what the fuck? This is <laughs> <laughs> And he's tripping him out. <laughs> I was cracking up. Did you did you guys see the article? Jackie sent over an article about uh, some, I think it's called South, uh, S-O-T-H-E-B-A-Y or something like that. South, it's South Sotheby's. Bay. Sotheby's. 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 You know what Sotheby's, Sotheby's is? No. They do, don't they do auctions for really expensive items? Uh, you think yeah. You're right. I, oh, yeah. I've never like heard of Like super, Sotheby's, super, yeah. super exclusive shit. Oh, I've never yeah. even heard of them before. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. No. You mm -hmm. know what they were too, Doug? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you too, Justin? Yeah. Oh, wow. Just fucking me, huh? Yeah. Well, yeah. thanks for just pointing that out before. <laughs> You're the money guy, too. What the hell? Yeah, yeah no, I never. Yeah. So, okay, explain. They, they do, they auction like. Uh, That's all I know about them is that if you have. Yeah, something, tell me what. Give me I a think run. they also do high end real estate. Uh, yeah, I can look it up. I think it's like super exclusive. Oh, I had no like, idea. Place yeah, where you yeah give buy. me a rough idea of what this company does. That was the first time I ever heard of this company. So, they just sold their first, first house that will be on blockchain, right, through Ethereum. And it will also have a mirrored metaverse house. Oh gosh! Wow. So, wow. and and I mean, this is going to be interesting, right? If like the future of when you buy real estate, you also give it it's to me. It's the largest, most trusted and dynamic 1744? marketplace for art, art and luxury. Oh, dude, this is so Sotheby's. Yeah, like I knew it was art. This though. is where the lizard people sell their shit and buy their <laughs> shit. You know what yeah. I mean? That's how established it is. Okay. Let's say you had like a. An original, you know, Da Vinci or how, something. How do I this not? I had it. no idea Sweet. about this company. Really? Yeah, I feel like I've been living under a rock to not know that. That's so, so is this? So the dimensions, everything will be exactly, exactly the same. same. Okay. And and so you will get except this. one's real. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, so the the article is talking about how you know when these because here's the thing that I have a hard time understanding is you know if you buy these things in the metaverse, what happens if because it's infinite how big it is. And yeah, you know, the, what's the, the what value you has to be? People want to go to. Yeah, it. you you have to buy, or otherwise you're somewhere up in bumfuck Egypt, and nobody gives a f shit. Nobody wants to come to your side of the. I think that's a real place, by the way. Bumfuck? It is. Yeah, is it? It is. I think it is. I know yeah. Timbuktu is. Timbuktu for sure. Yeah. Timbuk maybe Doug, look up bumfuck. Don't click <laughs> on images. <laughs> yeah, see I, I think so. <laughs> what that is. But okay, uh, now yeah. Maybe, though, the natural progression is what we'll see is, for example, Snoop Dogg has a house in the metaverse yeah, right now. Yeah, you'd want to go to Snoop Dogg's like, metaverse house. You want to party. Well, in, and somebody- if he's going to be there. So because yeah. he, he bought that and has established where he is, somebody has already paid $450,000 for the real estate right next to of him. Of course. Uh, yeah. So I do get like- So I get if somebody is that is 
famous and has a you know a cult of people that follow them that and they sense. buy in there that that's i mean it's kind of like how well, uh, how, much how house- starbucks buys real estate in real life yes. right they they don't a lot of times they don't even go in and do a lot of work they I'm just go in a weed shop if, McDon- the if mcdonald's is there they know mcdonald's has done all the work they have enough draw and people that okay we, we go there we're they gonna be the successful research. So, all right, let me ask you uh, this question, right? So, who's your favorite? Who's a celebrity or athlete that you like really want to meet? Is there one for you? I'm not really like that, but I, I'm a big Dennis Rodman fan. So, let's just okay, use him for your, for your example. Okay, oh, so let's Charles say, Barkley. Okay, okay so let's say awesome. Charles Barkley or Dennis Rodman have a house in the metaverse. It's identical to theirs. And you could pay a $1,000 ticket to visit his house in the metaverse, and you know that his avatar will be there, and he's there controlling it. So, you actually get to meet him through the computer. Right. I would do that, right? Yeah, a lot of people would. I could see mm-hmm. a lot of people doing it. Yeah, that. no, if you know that, again, if I knew that Dennis Rodman's house is right there and I could buy the house right next door for- Dude, It's a real place. It's not really a place. Oh, okay. No, it's a an expression that means the middle of nowhere yeah. and it comes from the military. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So it's not real, but Timbuktu is. It's, yeah. And it's literally spelled T-I-M-B-U- I thought it's B-O-O-K. Tim, like no. it's like it's like an T I M B U K no B U T U or something, something like, like that. Look yeah, it up. That's a real up. place, Timbuktu. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's like an African city or town, right? Yes, T I M B U K T U. Yeah, Timbuktu. You have to say it Timbuktu. like that. Yeah, yeah. got Not it. Tim All I know is Lake Titicaca. That's a fun one to say. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> I was listen, I was listening to uh, Gary V because obviously Gary V. That's kids have a blowout. Yeah. Oh, got all the way up there, huh? Yeah. You, you know, know Gary Vee's like a huge NFT guy, and he's like he's one of the people that are kind of pushing this movement. But even him, like I overheard him saying that, you know, believes that you know ninety percent of these uh, will end up being nothing. You know, yeah. they won't, yeah, of course, they isn't won't he go. just making chicken scratch and making those into NFTs? Yeah, well, he so, because he made them though, they'll have some value at some right. 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 Well, he uh, what I think he understands, and and I do agree with is if you already have. A, a network of people, that's the hard part, right? right. Building a, a network of a, a, a million yeah. people that give a fuck about what you're doing, right? Th- that's a big deal. That's, that's the only that's, way you have weight. Right, and so you you selling something that gives virtual access to you is definitely got value to that. Yeah. To your point you were just bringing up, if like, I could be I, right I next to- I go to Snoop Dogg's virtual house if I knew his, he was operating an avatar that was in there. Right, but I'm not buying a, a house next to Steve- who just loves to buy and invest in NFTs in the yeah, metaverse, and yeah, I don't know anything yeah. about him, and you know, well, I, I don't think care about, about buying a house. You'd next be to him. rubbing elbows with hmm. other successful people in that metaverse, you know. So you're walking around with your avatar, and you're like, "Oh shit, there's so and so." So that's look, the there's... concept of this, which is kind of interesting, right? It'd be kind of cool if I had a uh, a a virtual version of my current house right now, and I could host these virtual parties. Everybody puts their hmm. Oculus goggles on and stuff, and then you're now hanging out in what looks exactly like my house in the real world. And, you know, if you spill on my carpet, it's not a big deal, right? So it's <laughs> so there's some cool parts of it like Dude, that. Everything's and you guys, weird. I mean, you guys have now experienced, I brought the Oculus up to Utah, so you guys have been playing it a little bit more, stuff like that. I mean, how real and hella cool, weird right super weird and so I had a weird thought that like uh, what if you know there's like these houses you kind of go in you're checking out and like one of them was like an mlm party you know like they made it into the uh, they trapped you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like no it's made it here i hate too. those by the way if you ever get a, a like a message on facebook from an old friend in high school always nine out of ten times what are you dude. lunch i yeah. was thinking about you the other day yeah. adam remember me john and you high wear school? makeup right yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh dude we should grab some lunch sometime you know what i mean you're into organic stuff right Oh, yeah. already, oh, shit. You're a health guy. Here's yeah, some juice. Some, or, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever heard of the goji berry? Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> it's miraculous uh, with the it's stuff huge. that it does. It's anyway, I, I read an interesting article and study on competitiveness and the difference between competitiveness in men and women. So okay. there's, there's a difference. There's and it's a difference, very, huh? It's very interesting. So in the article, they sure, were talking about the, the income gap. And then they talked about in the article how when you control for, factor, for all the other factors – the income cap shrinks considerably. And so then it's not this whole like 70 something cents to the dollar. It's more like 98 cents to the dollar. But still, there's a two cent difference between men and women when we control for all these factors. And the theories are men and women are competitive differently and men seek out, you know, money, whereas women want other things, you know, or consider other things more important. I, What's the deal? I feel like I need to get you to it because you, you just said something that is going to trigger a bunch of people that, that there's was a, a point. That there's, I know, that yeah. there's a two cent difference and you need to, you need to explain how you came up with that and not what everybody else tries to say right no, now. No, so when you look at all of this and you, so there's a gender pay gap. And in 2021, they'll say that women will earn 82 cents for every dollar earned by men. 
but it doesn't account for certain characteristics such, such as an employee's age, experience, level of education, whether or not they stop employment to do something else and then come back, like those kinds of things. And when they- Like have a baby, you mean? Whatever, right? Yeah. So that's a common one, right? So when they factor all that stuff in, um, then you find that it goes from 82 to 98 cents. So actually the, 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 the pay gap almost all but disappears, but there's still a, a 2% difference. And so like, what's, what's going on here? And so they did the study on competitiveness between men and women to see what the difference was. And there was this game that they played where you, you, you could make a bet. And if you won, um, you, if you won, then it's, you could keep all the earnings. Um, or there was another game where if you won, then you get to share the earnings with the people who, who lost. Okay. When people were given the option to, when, when the, when the, when the winner takes all, uh, 51% of men chose that. Whereas 35% of women chose that. So only 35% of women wanted to compete if it was win, win or take all, whereas 51% of men wanted to, wanted to take uh, to well, engage. What was, what was the risk factor in both those cases? Same, because I do know that there's also those studies that show that men are way more likely to take risk. Yes. It, with, no, this is the same competition. Now, when, the, when they were given the option to share their winnings, the amount of women, the percentage of women willing to compete went from 35 to 60%. For men, it was 52%. So it was almost equal. 50-50 for men, if I can share it, or if I take all hmm. with women, it was 35 versus 60%. And so they said, why is that? Like, why was it that the women were so much more likely to compete when they were able to share the winnings versus when it was winner take all? And here's the theory that, I guess, uh, one among nurture, all the theories. They're nurturers. Yeah. Well, well it's what, it, was, it was not that. No? Oh, It was not that they wanted to help and take care of others. Oh, interesting. Hmm. It was female participants may be more inclined to smooth over bad feelings with losers of the competition. So they're huh. they were they're more we're likely guys that don't give a fuck. Yes, <laughs> we would rub it yeah, in but more. Again, it's, <laughs> that is lost. empathy based because they're trying to make everybody feel good. Well, and if you go back from you know again evolutionarily speaking, women were the society builders. So right. when the, when the, the you know this is how the theory goes. This is the the most accepted <laughs> one. Men were off hunting, and there isn't much. We're not going to sit. We the men didn't talk and discuss who's doing what. It was like you fall in line and you go, right? right. And you see this in lots of different- Hunt, kill, protect, very Hunt, basic. Yeah, and yeah. very basic. And yeah. you see this with boys. If there's a hierarchy with boys and they grow up together, it stays pretty stable. The, the leader boy in fourth grade tends, tends to still be the same kid in 10th grade. Whereas with girls, it's very flexible and malleable and people move around and that kind of stuff. And the theory is that they built the societies. They were behind. They were with the kids. They were, they were developing the religions, the spiritual practices, the- they were, you know, working together. Whereas the men were out doing certain things, not talking as much, and you know, have, and, and it's because it became that's how, what made us successful hunters versus successful in building the societies. So that makes sense when you consider that. If you win and you're evolutionarily speaking concerned about building society, then you're like, I'll win, but I want to be able to share with these losers to make sure that everybody's kind of cool. Whereas the more men are more likely to be like, if I win, it's mine. Mm -hmm. And you don't get it, you know, type of deal. Yeah, yeah. Now the, the difference wasn't massive. It's 35 to 50%. So it's a significant, but not huge, but still significant enough to show that there's a difference. I thought that was so fascinating. Yeah. Now, do you I have any that. theories That's on like uh, some unintended, uh, unintended consequences from uh, the narrative being pushed differently or us becoming more like the, just in the last, I mean, we could compare to our, our parents' generation. How much more it was, you know, the the man worked, the wife stayed at home, took care of the family, the kids, and the house. Yeah, it's become way more, uh, you know, even as far as how often you see that in a household. Right? Yeah. There's many times where the woman has now become the provider, or it's the house is fifty fifty, equal responsibilities and stuff. Do you, and and that's been we've been pushing that way for the last maybe fifty years, and for a lot of good reasons. I think there's a, there's a lot of positive reasons, but but do you see any unintended consequences from something like that, or are we seeing things already coming from that? You know, not so much from that. If you look at the data, first off, women still do a majority of the housework, even if they work. So if a husband and wife work, the wife still does the majority of the housework. Uh, however, the man tends to um, value earning potential higher, whereas the wife tends to value earning potential, but also do I have time to be with my family and handle other things? So there seems to be a balance. The issue becomes, here's when you see the big challenge, is when there's a lack of one or the other. So if 
if it, if there's no none of that traditional male involvement or none of the traditional female involvement, then you start to see some dysfunction. What's more evident right now is the dysfunction of a lacking male in the home, mainly because nine out of ten times, if one of the you know if the man or if it's it's about ninety percent more likely that the man is going to abandon the family than the, than the woman. So single parents tend to mo- almost always be moms. And so what you, the best thing we can do is look at that and say, okay, what are some of the challenges? What happens with the outcomes with the children? What does that look like? And it's clear you could start to see some, some challenges with that. On the flip side, there's also imbalances and dysfunction. So you need both to balance out. And it's really interesting, mm-hmm. right? Men and women are, are, by the way, we're way more similar than we are different. But in the ways that we tend to be different, they're, it's almost like we evolved to complement each other. So, and they're both kind of necessary, totally. you know? Um, so, and I've heard people argue that this whole, cause something like 40 to 50% of kids today are raised without a father. It's like a huge number. It's really, really big. And there's people who have argued and said, you know, that this, th- the result, you know, this whole, tr- you know, trophy, no matter what happens, right? So whether you win, lose, whatever, you get a trophy. Let people say, oh, that's because there's not a lot of dads uh, in the mix. And so it's a lot of moms running it and they don't want anybody to have hurt feelings type of deal. So there's a little bit of dysfunction there because as we know, life doesn't give everybody a trophy type of deal. But on the flip side, uh, I mean, I could I could just speculate on what the dysfunction would be if it was just men raising a bunch of kids. Right. Totally. I think it'd be, be like Lord of the Flies. Yeah. yeah no so, compassion. <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's got to be that middle ground. Oh, yeah. Know, so it, both considered. Totally. So what's cool about the about studies like this, I, and I hate when people position it like better, better, and this is worse, and that's superior. It's not. It's all together. It's all complementary. One without the other sucks, regardless mm-hmm. of which, you know which direction yeah. you go. So you have to take on both roles. At that you point. have to take on both roles. Anyway, I wanted to tell you guys about, um, Jessica has been using the juve light on her face again, cause she stopped for a while. And, uh, she, so, you know, the go, the small one. Yeah. yeah. She gave it to her grandmother and her grandmother was using it in San Diego, loving it. And then we bought her grandmother one so that we could get the old one back. So Jessica didn't use it for a while. She got it back, started using it again. And I swore within a week, it's like I come home and I'm like I look at her and I'm like you look different hmm. you know like your your skin looks I couldn't tell she's like oh I'm using the juve light again like it's remarkable what a difference it makes they've totally updated their line I I totally <laughs> I have like one of the original ones like it, they have now these cool stands for the same model that are you I have. using yours regularly still yeah real I'm I'm I wouldn't say I'm like there's times where I go on a breaks where maybe it's been two weeks where I haven't used it I mean I was behind it yesterday the day before that I was so. Um, you know, when we're going, traveling, moving around so that, and I'm inconsistent with my training, I'm inconsistent with that. It's like anything else. Like when I'm on my consistency with training, it's exactly and, like that. You yeah. stop using it, you lose the effect. Yes. It's not like you do it. A it is times totally like that. Permit. It's not, it's not one of those things where you reap the benefits and then you keep those, but it's like, you have to stay up on have it. Have you to- seen some of the before and afters that people were post with their face from using it? I haven't. It's like. It's almost unbelievable, and I would say it's unbelievable if I didn't see it myself. And I hate to say this; it sounds like a stupid commercial, but it literally makes your skin look younger. And Do you, you know how I know it's like blowing up and moving in that dr- uh, direction of it's becoming more popular than ever. So you're starting to see it in like uh, television shows and yes. and movies and stuff like that, where there'll be like a main character in there, and there'll be a, and they'll just be subtle about it. They won't even talk about it, but you'll see them using uh, uh, infrared light. And they've got, there's all kinds of brand of products where there's like a face mask yeah. one they do, yeah. or just like a oh, little. The studies clear. By the way, this well, is not way less invasive than like a Botox or something. Dude, like that, this is know? not bullshit. This, look up the studies. Look up red light therapy and skin. It's con- it conclusively results in less fine lines and wrinkles and improved collagen production. So it's not bullshit. I know it sounds hard. It's hard to believe. Yeah. But it's uh, it's legit. It used to be uh, a product that was relegated to the super wealthy. That's why nobody had it. It was so expensive that the only way you could use one was at a a, a salon you know one of well they're spas. still they still are pretty expensive they're not cheap at all for not the, like they re, used for to the be. legit real one though that's the problem though i think is there's a lot of scammers out there that are just making a red bulb and then trying to pawn it off as uh infrared light yeah but it's totally not the it, only it, downside is your neighbors think you're running a satanic cult yeah remember when oh, i told, when the red light remember I the told you guys that downside my yeah. old townhouse like when i it's had it on, low, dude. i had it on the third floor and it reflects all off the white walls so it does it makes yeah. like every window in the house was glowing red it was so have funny. you ever seen there's a picture of a house uh you just made me think of this there was this picture of this house in the snow 
and the, the it had snow on all the whole roof. It was like a multi-unit. It was, so it looked like an apartment complex almost. And there was a bunch of snow. And then in the middle, there was a big bare spot with no snow. And then the meme said, uh, oh, I can tell who's growing weed in this house. I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. I, see, I have seen that. <laughs> have you seen that? <laughs> Doug, what is, that, what is that DM you got yeah, up there? Yeah, so we had somebody reach out to us and said that they've been using the Juve light uh, consistently every single morning for 10 minutes, just got their lab work back, and testosterone had increased by 200 points. Yeah. I mean, that was Woo. what sold me was when uh, Mike and I were talking. Uh, Mike Mutzel, right? Yeah. Mutzel, yeah. how you say his last name? Yep. And he showed me his labs before, and he says the only thing I changed was the Juve light. He was doing it three times a week for twenty minutes consistently. It kicks the mitochondria Shining right on his and uh, it, groin. And same thing, it, it jumped like two to uh, two to four. It might have been like four hundred base. It was crazy how much it testosterone jumped. It up. kicks it, it. It it basically turbocharges the mitochondria. So if you're on your skin, it makes your skin regenerate faster. If it's in the light cells in the testes, it makes them produce more testosterone. Um, there's even studies that shining this light on the brain, which is totally different. You can't do this with a normal light because obviously your skull stops it. But they did a study to show that if and this was an animal study, improved cognitive function. So it's a potential for treatment of dementia. So very interesting. And the science has been around for a long time. This is stuff yeah. that we've seen. What's since your theory then on things like, because we, Max, we have, Katrina had Max in front of it the other day trying because he's getting over the flu and stuff like that. What do you think about even helping with recovering from something like that? You got sick. I don't and, know. Yeah. Yeah, I have no idea. I was trying, I actually got online. I started like trying to see if I could find any studies to support the the benefits yeah. of it. I have I, no I idea. wonder because it's just so, it's one of those magical things that you don't believe like all these added benefits yeah. it provides, but then you go through all the studies and it's pretty amazing. Well, it, well you think of like if it's, if it's helped recover the mitochondria, I would think that that has so much carryover into anything. Like the, that, that in itself is so beneficial for everything. It is. I just, like, I don't know what that would mean for mitochondrial dysfunction. Necess I don't know. It's interesting. I had no idea. Right. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't either. I tried to find, I tried to look up studies because Katrina was telling me that Max was in front of that. You know what? I, should, I go, you know what? That's probably not a bad idea. Let me see if I could find anything yeah. to support why it's a great idea. And yeah. I couldn't find anything. Uh. Theoretically, it sounds like it would make it makes sense. Hey, so I wanted to ask you, Adam. So, um, did you see the heat that um, Chamath and I don't know how to pronounce his last name, Doug? Maybe you can pull it from up the his All last In name. podcast. From All In, did you see? Yeah, the heat you know it's funny. We all sat and watched that episode. I, his China policy, the fact that he came out with a statement on the Uyghurs, I thought it was very strong. You know, it's one of the stronger things he did. But yeah, nobody cares about what's happening to the Uyghurs. Okay, you you bring it up because you really what? care, and I think what that's do you mean nice that you cares? care. The rest of us don't care. I'm just well, telling you a very care? hard. Wait, wait, I'm you're telling you, you very, personally don't care. I'm telling you a very hard, ugly truth. Okay, of all the things that I care about, yes, it is below my line. Okay, oh, of all the things that I care about, it is below my line. Disappointing. That, that was like the first one I watched the whole. Right, uh, you've never podcast. watched the whole thing before. Yeah. We all at, up in Utah decided to throw on the episode because we hadn't seen it together. Um, not my favorite episode they done, although it was really good. All their stuff I really like. Uh, um, Poly Hapitia. Polyhapitia, something like that, Chamath. So he's a billionaire. Um, he was one of the founders, I believe, first people at Facebook, uh, yeah. big investor, obviously very influential. Part owner of the Warriors. Yeah, and they they were talking back and forth, and one of the hosts brought up the Uyghurs in China, which are, this is a Muslim group yeah. that is being, you know, I guess they're reporting that they're being thrown in, in concentration camps, they're being suppressed, right. they're being fully, they're forcefully sterilized. Uh, yeah, they're and, doing really bad shit over there. And Chamath, now this is... I'm so glad I watched the whole podcast because, and I talk about this all the time, but it's so hard to identify that when you, they can take something out of context in order to attack you and come after you. Right, right. And Chamath, although he identifies as a, a Democrat, sometimes he says things that are not very, you know, liberal or, or whatever. He's very pro free market, I guess. Nonetheless, he's political. All of them have political opinions, which makes them targets. Yeah. And so he was on there and his partner was bringing up the Uyghurs. And Shamoth said, I literally don't care about them. And he, but now the way he explained it, you have to watch the whole podcast. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I do not at all agree with all the attack pieces on him. No, I, it, you know, it was interesting. I hope he doesn't Prager, Prager you came after him, right? I know. So, and I commented uh, underneath. This is both sides really were. Yeah. Using so, that. um, 
you know, so the, the, the conservative side came after him pretty hard because it was an easy clip and you call it what you did call it while we were watching like, oh, he's going to get trashed for that yep. for sure. Yep. Because you can see like if you rip that soundbite out it, and make it and he's already got kind of a smug personality. Oh, he, he, right? he's he a comes sm- across as a cock. Yeah. You know? yeah. But I mean, I, I actually I like appreciate him. that about him. He's very <laughs> yeah, I, I like his personality. I yeah. like him and stuff like that. Very unfiltered. Yeah. 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 You either do. You, I mean, he's definitely I'm sure he's very polarizing. Right. So you either really like him or you don't like him at all, which I'm sure. But anyways, they, they took that out of context and when you knew that he was going to tear him up for that but i 100 percent uh, agree with him yeah but and so- i don't i don't and i don't agree with him because i don't care about that so much but as i come from a place where and i think jordan peterson talks about this a lot really well of you know the one of the best ways that we can impact the world is w- within yourself and internally because you have first. the most because yep. yeah, you have the most control and impact that's right Yep. So like, what he said, and, and this is the context. So if you watch the clip, he says, I don't care about the Uyghurs. That's the bottom of my list. That's below my whatever. My line. Yeah, he my said. line. What he was saying was, if you listen to the whole podcast, was essentially this. A lot of people say they care about stuff. And the reason why they say is to virtue signal. Oh, my God. Like, like, uh, like Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh, the climate. Oh, climate change. And then he's got a yacht that literally will produce more carbon than all of us in this room will ever do in a hundred lifetimes from one yacht, right? That's how much mm-hmm. this guy produces himself. So a lot of people say they care, but their actions show different. And he says, look, I know people say they care. Nobody gives a shit. Nobody really cares. What people care about is the stuff that's right in their backyard. And mm-hmm. he's being honest. And this is totally true. I'm going to speak very truly, you know, very honestly. Now I care about my family. Then I care about my friends. Then I care about the my local area. And it's all in this order, right? It's in yeah. that order. So yeah, I, I care that shit's happening across the world. Am I taking action against it? Probably not. Yeah, so. his point was you can't... Um we can't uh, quantify like evil or bad or suffering, right? right? There's suffering and evil and bad in our own backyard that we're not addressing. That we have more impact. Yeah, over. that we have more yeah. impact that affects us directly because it's in our backyard. And it's not that I don't care about those things. It's just that we really ought to fix this shit first. It's kind of like the um, when you when they when you talk they talk on the the airplane, right? Put yeah. the mask on your own face first before you put the mask. Yeah, otherwise on your, you can't help your kid. That's right. So yeah. and and it, at first it doesn't. People think, wow, I'm not gonna save my kid, but it's just like, well, you can't save your kid if you can't if, if you're you can't dead, save your yourself kid's dead, first. 100. Mm-hmm. And so I, it's kind of the same type of logic is. You know, we we have to take care of our own our own backyard, clean your own room first mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, before you start worrying but about yeah, I, I agreed, everybody else. I agreed room. with what he was saying, and basically what he was saying was is he was being very honest and, and essentially saying this: n- none of you care either. You guys say you care, but yeah. what about your actions? Which that's a hard pill to swallow because it is, dude. Yeah, that's. I mean, that tends to be you know uh, a common a common thing these days is like try to tackle the really big huge problems or at least bring awareness to it is like the biggest push for a lot of people yeah, out there like, versus you know really honing in on the actionable steps look you talk right to the average person and you say hey do you care about your health and your fitness yes definitely then you look you don't exercise at all you eat garbage every single day you rely on pharmaceutical drugs and caffeine and alcohol to, you know, medicate yourself throughout the day. Right. You are lying. You're saying you care because it's saying you don't care. You don't want to say that. You want to say you care, but the reality is your actions show that you don't. And it's just being honest. That's all it is. And that's what he was saying. And he's just, you know, he comes across as a dick. That's just how he talks. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. that, to be honest with you. But they definitely took that clip and they are hammering it. And what I hope he yeah. doesn't do, and I hope he's listening. Chamath, I hope you do not go on your podcast and apologize and bow down because I know there's a lot of pressure on him right now. I hope because the way they're attacking him is this: is they're saying, "Oh, this the uh, owner of the Warriors, yeah, billionaire, billionaire doesn't want to say he he's he's against the Uyghurs in China." And what they're trying to say is because the NBA, is yeah, so they're trying to say he has financial interest in people that are giving him money, and so he doesn't. And it has nothing to do with yeah. that. Like, also, he was, he was very clear if you listen to the whole episode. Yes, like and there's stance. a lot of other stuff that was said in that podcast that a lot of people don't realize. Like the world is very complex. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes we make decisions based off of feelings without um, considering potential downstream effects. For example, I'll use a great example. You could go into a country and see a factory where there's 10 year olds working and it's hot in there and they're working for 12 hours a day. And you're like, this is terrible. And so through your money and your influence, you make a ban on it and you shut these factories down and you're like, yay, I succeeded. And you don't pay attention to what happened next. And the next thing you know, 
all those 12 year olds now are on the street selling their bodies for right. sex, for money, right. for whatever. Or starving and die. Right. So not saying that you should have a sweat you know, f- factory or whatever, but the point is that it's way more complex. And so just saying, you know, well, I'm not going to do business with that. For example, some people would say we shouldn't trade with China at all. Screw them. They're communists. They do evil shit. And I agree uh, with a lot of that, but I don't agree we should not do tr- any trade with them because the single biggest deterrent to war ever in the history of, human, of, of mankind is trade. Countries that trade heavily tend to not attack each other. They just don't they're, because their, their interests yeah, are intertwined. <laughs> we were at way greater risk with the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union and us, we shut shit down. And we stopped working together. Speaking of that, would you see what's going on with Canada right now? The 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 protests that are happening up there. Oh, is this where the the truckers are yes. shutting shit down? Wow, yeah. that's getting serious. They're blocking the roads too. I think I I, I read. Is that? Do you guys know if that's true or not? Like, I heard I they know. shut down the gyms and everything without a um, a date to uh, stop the mandates. Dude, they need to stop. The, the game is over. Did you see the study that came out of Israel? N- no. Oh yeah, about the fourth, four, yeah, fourth f- shot not helping the, anything. The, the second booster, which is the fourth shot, I guess, uh, ineffective against Omicron. So essentially a waste, of, a waste of time. The whole narrative is starting to break down and th- these policies, these draconian policies, mm. they're, they're, they need to stop because they're not popular and they're not helping. Yeah. People are getting At pissed off. At this point, it just looks like a power grab. I mean, what else can you describe it as if, I, if the data doesn't support your your mandates? I mean, how much are we going to be affected by uh, shipping coming down from Canada into the U.S.? Dude, there's going to be supply issues for a while. You have that going on. You have some protests going on in Europe. And then China is locking shit down hard to try because that's their answer to, to, to COVID. And because they're communists, they can literally lock you in your house. So they're locking shit down. So we're going to have some supply chain issues for a little while. So we'll see. We'll see what we'll see happens. See what it's going to do with the market and stuff like that. Uh, I don't Here know, we man. go. I know. I feel bad. I mean, can I already I already feel bad bad for Canada because so many of our partners don't ship up to Canada. Now they're going to have more supply chain issues as as it is. You know. I know, yes. dude. It's super crazy. Hey, did you guys crazy. did you guys see the satellite imagery of the volcanic explosion, the Tongan volcano explosion? Did that you see was this? really. I mean, it Uh-oh. was. I didn't see it. It was really cool, but also like kind of scary. Bro, right? Doug, can you pull this up? This is from space. Literally an image. Oh, from is that space. the one that Joe posted? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that was like a, a meteor. I thought impact. that was. Uh, oh shit! I thought that was like a, a simulation. Like if this, would this. No, that happened. No, that that's was an real. actual satellite image. Whoa! I didn't yeah. know that. You know, I didn't read that's the how thing. Big I just that was going through it. Was. Oh no! Well, way. I mean, it, it actually caused a, a little bit of a uh, tsunami that that made its way all the way here to Santa Cruz yeah. and flooded um, the harbor. Well, no, in our backyard too. Katrina said there was all the, she was showing me pictures of the the pier, like how much the water was up. It was wild, all the way from over there. Wow! So you want to hear the conspiracy theory? Uh, oh, there's a conspiracy. There theory? is. Of course, there is. Oh, that it was a it hilarious. was a, a North Korean nuclear test. No. Yeah, and they're trying to play it off as like what? a volcanic explosion. I know. I'm sure it's bullshit. <laughs> Whoa, I did see that. I didn't realize that that was a... Re- I actually thought that was somebody like doing like a computer simulation if if this, something like this were to go no. off. Oh, wow. No, that was real. Oh, shit. Yeah. Did you did you know that one of the greatest threats to humanity is a uh, super volcano? Mm-hmm. So... They, they think what um, Yellowstone is a super that, volcano dude. in the making. Look at that. That's like the size of like a small... Like like a like a small country, yeah. How big that explosion is! Isn't that wow. insane? There's a lot of cool footage of it. Look at that, dude! It's like it's wow. like the size of California. The cloud wow. that came out of there. Isn't that crazy? It looks bigger than that. Well, that's bro. fake because like like this is around Earth. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> <It's fake. laughs> like to, yeah. We know like Earth is actually, real is actually flat. Yeah, but uh, yeah, Yellowstone is a super volcano, and if it exploded, it would probably cause a mass extinction around the world. So just so you guys, you know, you guys sleep. <laughs> Great <laughs> uplifting content at yeah, the end yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Just to sleep. Just to sleep. <laughs> All right, I'll do some uplifting content. Yeah. Uh, I am attempting. Let's see how long my if my gut health will will actually stay good because it's actually really good right now and it's been for a while. I'm going to attempt to do a legit bulk. So when you when you decide you're going to switch over to that, like, what is your uh, one? What is about how many calories you go for? And then is there a preferred nutrient or thing that you add for those additional calories that you tend to go towards. Okay, so you're going to be really mad at me because I really don't have no idea. I'm assuming I'm eating around <laughs> 3,800 calories if I had to kind of make a guess, 35 yeah, yeah. to, to 4,000. Um, and my but gut health is always a thing that gets in the way. So I always have to kind of bring it down if shit gets inflamed. And But right now it's been really good. So what I've done is instead of adding tons and tons more calories and risking 
you know, inflaming my gut and causing me to have setback or whatever. Yeah, yeah. All I'm doing is I'm adding uh, two Organifi protein shakes a day. So I'm eating like I normally do, but I'm adding two, oh, wow. two shakes a day, huh? two 30, 30 to 40 gram shakes a day. So that's an additional, you know, what are you that? mixing just with water? What do you water. mix? Water. Just water. Just water. And not adding anything, fruit or anything like that. That's just no. So like up. another 60 to 75 or so grams of protein and the yeah. calories that come along with it. Right, right. So like and probably I can, 400, 400 to 500 calories yeah. and 70 grams of protein. And I can already tell. I can already tell. I've done, I've done it now for a few days and I can tell, uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to see if my body weight will get up to 215, which I haven't been that heavy in, in years. I'm like 209 right now. So we'll see what happens. Oh, but wow. the but the the their protein is pretty easy on my gut, so I can I can eat that and not have a big you know not have an issue. Well, those twisted sugar cookies should probably help you out a little Damn. bit. I mean, that was <laughs> <laughs> this guy, dude. Oh, we had destroyed we, all of us when we were in Utah. Shout out to that company, right? This is not a commercial. I can't even believe that's a company that by them. Yeah, it's Utah has these two things that we have never seen, at least over here in the Bay Area, which was the twisted sugar cookies, which are these like. Like super like cookie cakes, yeah, like tiny cookie yeah, cakes. rich. You you basically go on there and you or, you can order all these weird cookies and different flavors. They were delicious though, dude. But yeah. I mean, they're so rich that like one is enough. Um, and Sal was so funny because he would he wouldn't even eat one. He would just take like a quarter of it. But then all day long, I seen him go into the box. Yeah, it added up to like <laughs> yeah. So so it ended up being like nine cookies yeah. broken up in quarters. I was micro 18, 18, 18, I was micro dosing cookies size. all day. Yeah, your thirty six <laughs> visits, right? <laughs> you were micro dosing. That's what I was doing. But they have that, and then the other one was their like uh, soda. Yeah, their twi- what did they call the soda one? Was called what was that called? The- I don't remember. <sighs> Was that yeah. also no? There was twisted cookie. Right? But I think they had soda too. And then well, there was a soda. No, one. twisted sugar. Twisted sugar. Yeah. Oh, and they spiked also spiked soda, not spiked sodas. But yeah, they they like make dirty, soda? dirty, dirty soda. Dirty soda. That's, That's what it was called. Yeah. Dirty sodas. Thank yeah. you. Doc. So basically, yeah. you pick the flavor. Then you can add if you want it to be an energy drink, and you can make it weird. You could add cream to it. You could do all kinds of weird stuff to it, and get a soda. And they deliver it to your door, or you go pick it up. And I thought this was a brilliant. Yeah, it's almost like model. what you did as a kid when you're just experimenting all the different flavors of the sodas, and then adding, you know, extra stuff in there. Yeah. Like, so I used they to made a that. business out of that. I yeah. used to do that. I would mix like like Sprite with uh, with with Coke. Yeah, and like root beer. Dr Pepper. Yeah, some kind of cherry. I never Coke. really got into that. I don't know. Why, I don't, and I, and you're I a like, Coca Cola guy. I am. A, Have you I, always been a Coca Cola guy? Uh, no, I was a Pepsi kid. What is there a difference? Is there really a difference? Oh, yeah. I could totally yeah, taste the difference. difference. Which one? What's the difference? I, I'm a Coke guy. So I like Coke, too. Uh, Pepsi tastes sweeter to me. Mm. Does it really? Yeah. Mm. Or stronger. I don't know how to explain did you know it. The Coca-Cola it's definitely at, different. Did you know the Coca-Cola at McDonald's? They add more syrup to yeah, it? I told you that. That's why. You're no. the one that told me? Yeah, because I had a girl in high school who literally would, like, she would eat somewhere else and then go through McDonald's to get to their get the Coke. Coke. And I always thought, what? It's like the same. She's like, no, it's not. They, yeah. Their sugar to syrup ratio is different. Oh. So I don't know if it's the if they actually add more, but their their ratio of- It's like a specific McDonald's ratio. Yeah, they have, ratio. A, they have like a, a patented ratio of wow. carbon to sugar mm. to syrup ratio, which is if anybody's ever had McDonald's Coke- I'm sure they sell more Coca-Cola place. than anybody else. I, yeah, I'm sure you're they, right. They have to. Yeah, no, I'm sure So you're Pepsi's right. a little sweeter. It, it has like a- a, a sharper taste to it. I'm trying to put words to what I what I feel. There. It definitely tastes. It doesn't different. have I mean, you can blind you can blindfold which, me and let me do a Pepsi and a yeah. and Coke. You'll, you'll do 100% it. Hundred percent. We'll be able to every get day. It. Every uh, I'd be ten out of ten. I guess. Really? Yeah. I mean, anybody who drinks one or the other, I think. Don't do you feel that way? Yeah. That you could blindfold it, tell the difference. I can between tell. Pe- We're gonna yeah. do oh, this. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I, We're gonna I, do this. But when I was a kid, I liked Pepsi. I'm gonna I was, trick you guys too. When I got like, can older, you taste I the one that I that I dip my thumb inside or something weird like that. Doug, you don't really drink any Coke or Pepsi, do you? Not really. I sometimes have a diet Coke. Yeah. I like Doug's that a, better than Doug's regular are Coke. You, are you a Coke? You're Coke, Coke-y. Coke. Are you you're a Coke, Coke guy? guy? Do you think you could tell the difference? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Totally, yeah. right? I think I can too. Bottle versus can. Uh, oh, I could tell that. Mm-hmm. I, okay, mm-hmm. now I could tell the difference between Mexican Coke and American Coke. Well, yeah, one's got yeah, real sugar. Like a, the real sugar. Yeah, if, if, super I'll, sweet. Yes, like, dude. Ugh, I'll get yeah. the real sugar one all day long. Yeah. Yeah, I was, growing up, I was a root beer. Root beer guy. Oh yeah, yeah I was more of a root That's beer mine. Kid. You too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which yeah. one? Would A&W. you like dad's? Dad's root beer. Dad's A and W. A is creamy and delicious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Justin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It no spon- floats out of it. That what a great commercial. We have to get a sponsor. Yeah, yeah. No, we're, not. we're not. We're not encouraging people. Oh, so the twisted sugar did have the dirty sodas also. They did. Mm. Oh, so we didn't get a chance to try that. But no, just- no, nobody's a Fanta fan in here, huh? A Fanta? I mean, oh, Fanta. You know, no, I used to do Orange Crush in the summer for some reason. It was always like I was drawn to like orange soda. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why. I mean, I I've always liked sodas. For I mean, I've been a soda drinker forever. But I switched over to Diet Coke like, I don't know, in my mid-20s. 
And I actually prefer a Diet Coke now than a regular Coke. Gross. Yeah, yeah I, I don't like the regular Coke. I only do, yeah, I only drink Coke if I'm, you know, mixing whiskey in it now. That's it. <laughs> it's the only time. Judge, <laughs> is that going to make this better? It's just, I don't know. Hey, do you like to work out, stay fit, but enjoy the occasional glass of alcohol, but then you feel like crap the next day and it affects your workouts? That was me until I found Z-Biotics. This is a company we work with. They make the world's first patented genetically modified probiotic drink designed specifically to break down one of the negative byproducts of alcohol consumption, acetaldehyde. When you get too much acetaldehyde, the side effects sound like this, headache, you feel crappy, bad mood, your gut is off. Sounds a lot like a hangover, doesn't it? Anyway, this probiotic drink that's patented, again, you can't find it anywhere, you drink it before you drink alcohol, the bacteria in your gut that you drink from this product go to work and they break down acetaldehyde. And when I use it, I feel way better the next day. I mean, remarkably better the next day. So it's a great product for those of you who are fitness and health minded who also enjoy the occasional glass of alcohol. Go check them out. We got a discount, of course. You can head over to mindpumppartners.com, click on Zbiotics, and then use the code mindpump10, mindpump10, for 10% off their products. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Cade from Washington. What's up, Cade? How can we help you? Hey, so I just had a question regarding basically optimizing muscle growth. Because so for I've been consistently training for about 10 years with a goal of just health and longevity. But recently, I found myself in a really good spot. So I'm about 5'10", about 154, 155. So I'm like 10-ish percent body fat. And I just, I don't know, I got it in me that I kind of want to see if I can push my body to do something like a, uh, a physique competition. So I was trying to see what would be a checklist that I could do to basically optimize muscle growth over the course of one or two years to put on maybe like 15, 20 pounds. Okay. Well, this um, is definitely Justin's wheelhouse. Yeah, I was going to say, I'll go ahead and feel this one, you guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Relax. Okay. <laughs> Physique competitor. I think, I think there's a lot more we need to know, right? So I, I would like to know uh, kind of what you're currently doing training-wise. Are you following any sort of program regimen? Do you follow any of the MAPS programs currently right now? And if you don't... Yeah, so I have uh, four of you guys' programs. I have anabolic performance aesthetic and power lift okay i'm just finishing up anabolic but i've kind of tweaked it to where i'm still working out it's not really trigger sessions i'm working out seven days a week basically where i'm kind of splitting some of the end of the workout because i don't really feel like i can give the like i'm in the third phase right now so like the superset with the the arm workouts i kind of push that off on its own day with maybe either a chest workout or a shoulder workout and then do some very light accessory stuff just to get a little bit more volume. Okay. So you're pretty much falling anabolic. You're just kind of splitting it up, which is totally cool. I do that sometimes where I split it up on the other days, um, but you're still following what's in the program. Um, yes. So the other question I'd have too is that if, you know, if you're a client of mine, I would love like a an off-season kind of bulking you know, stretch with you. And then we would do show prep and get ready. So if I could get like a year of your time, I would want to run like anabolic power lift, try to pack on as much muscle. And we'd do that in a bulk. So I'd at 10% body fat, you're already pretty lean. In fact, yeah. this is kind of like right when, when I was in season and off season, off season, I like to hover right around that 10. Maybe I'd let myself go as high as 12%, but I like mm -hmm. to keep myself close to to single digits getting ready for a show so I didn't have to do a long cut. So your body fat yep. percentage is perfect kind of where you're at. And I would love to run like a power lift, anabolic split type of routine within a calorie surplus to pack okay. on some good size for you. For, and I would want to do that for about three to six months, depending on uh, you know where our body fat is hanging around and stuff. And then mm -hmm switch you over to like a maps aesthetic and lean you out and get you ready for the show. And maps aesthetic was really inspired by kind of my show prep heading into a show. And, and I would start it off still in like a calorie surplus or maintenance. And then towards the, you know, final six to eight weeks, I would transition into a cut. And when you're this lean, when you're right around 10%, um, you don't need to be cutting longer than about probably six weeks. I think that's the mistake that some of these competitors make is they one they allow their body fat percentage to get so high 
And then when it's time to cut, they're doing like these 16 week cuts. I, I never cut longer than four to six weeks uh, because I maintain my body fat percentage about where you're at. If you're around 10 percent, you can easily drop four or five percent in six weeks. No problem, especially if you got a, a healthy metabolism and you're and you're dialed in. So that's kind of yeah. what I, I, I would want to do with you. Yeah. Um, to add to that, I'd say a big thing to focus on is going to be your your calories. Uh, obviously, you want to get a, about a gram of protein per pound of body weight, but you you should be increasing your calories by about 500 to 1,000 over what your maintenance is. So do you know what your maintenance calories are? Do you know how much you're eating right now? So actually, it's kind of – so I've been probably about three, four months now where I've been just like intuitively eating. I have a good idea that I'm around – Anywhere, I mean, it fluctuates, but I could be anywhere between like 27 to 3,000 calories. And I've actually been basically recomping for a couple months where I've consistently seen that I'm a little bit bigger and losing body fat at the same time. So, yeah. So, uh, estimates are notoriously inaccurate, even for experienced uh, people. I, I mean, I, I estimate, and when I go count and add things up, I find that I'm off by. Oh, that, that's me. That's me counting. Like I, I have an idea of how much the food I eat is. I just didn't like actually write it down. Okay. All okay. right. Yeah. Cause that's uh, obviously that is a, uh, I mean, that's the first step. So I'm, I'm glad yeah. Sal, you went that way is that, you know, if we, you and I were working together, I would need you to know yeah. to the calorie. Right. So I, I mean, I encourage people right. using like fat right. secret or my fitness pal so we can log it and we can make subtle adjustments. So yeah, track it. And then once you get the exact number, I'd go, Actually, I'd probably go. Are you are you more of a? I'm assuming you're more of a hard gainer than an easy gainer, considering your your body weight and your height. Is that? Would you yeah. say that's fair? Oh yeah, definitely. Okay, I would go a thousand calories over maintenance. Now, if you start to put on too much body fat, you could always bring it down to 500 over yep. maintenance. But I would add a thousand over what you're doing, and then you know go back to your training. The food is going to make the biggest difference. Obviously, if you're okay. following one of our programs, it's probably working all right for you, but. It's going to be the food. That's the big challenge. And if you're eating close to 3,000 calories, I mean, we're talking close to 4,000 calories. That's that's a bit challenging for people to do consistently. What people tend to do is they'll do 4,000 calories for a few days, and then you know they'll drop off for another few days, and actually totals out to be not that much of a of a surplus. So consistently, a 1,000 calorie surplus per day. Um, go with that. And then if your body fat starts to climb too quickly. You could cut that in half, but you got to be in that surplus to really pack on. You're, you're talking about 15 pounds of muscle, and to be yeah. honest with you, you've been working out for 10 years. 15 pounds yeah. of muscle in a one year after 10 years of training is gonna be hard. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be really hard. I, I would say more realistic would be closer to seven, but who knows? I know, mean, at knows? the end of the day, I wouldn't get too hung up on th that stuff, anyways. Like, really, my goal with you is if we're gonna do our first show and get ready for it, it's okay. Let's get your calories up. Um, as high as we can without putting on too much body fat, right? So, because what I really want to do is, I want to get you at a place where you know, let's say you're, you say you're around thirty seven hundred calories or so right now. We're, let's say we get you up to like forty five hundred calories, and it's like, man, I'm eating as much as I can, and it's awesome. I'm not putting on really body fat. I'm hovering around this ten to twelve percent. We're in a really good place to to transition you into a cut because your calorie intake is so high. I can peel you down. 500 calories tell you to walk a thousand more steps a day and you're going to start to lean out real nice and that's where we'd like to be and the the other thing i would add if you're not tracking this right now is to start to track your steps are you are you you have any idea of like how much you move on a daily basis um it's not that much i mean i go for a couple walks and so honestly that's the majority of it maybe like five six thousand Okay, cool. So that's I definitely have room to be much more active. Yeah, that's, just, that's a great that's a great pl for so for what you're trying to do. That's a good place to be because that gives me a lot of room to increase your steps. And I wouldn't do that yet, right? Right now we're we're, we're bulk phase, put on size, add the calorie sal sayings, uh, transition into one of the other programs after you finish anabolic. I was talking about try and bulk for the next program and get your calories up as high as you can, maintain your steps where they're at. And then when we switch into your cut, the first thing we're going to do is reduce your calories by about 500 calories and increase your steps by say just 2000 steps a day Yeah, through walking. One other thing too is uh, a lot of people, especially if you're natural, so if you're not um, enhanced with any anabolics or anything like that, m most people gain more mass with about four days a week of resistance training, maybe five at the most. Even though you're taking the volume up and splitting it up, you might be better off reducing the overall volume 
doing about four days a week, maybe in the gym. The other days you could stretch and do That's mobility work. That's a really good point. And you'll probably see yourself pack on more muscle. And I know it's hard to imagine, especially you've been working out so long, but you'll know within the first couple of weeks. You know, if you try that, go four days a week for the next couple of weeks, focus on you know kind of getting stronger, bumping your calories. Um, you, my guess is, and I would bet put money on this, that you're going to see a nice little bump in muscle and strength. How, how young are that. we? I don't, what's our age? Uh, I'm 28. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with Sal. Uh, and in fact, 28 is about when, when I started to piece this together, uh, in my mid twenties and early twenties, I was seven day a week. It was about intensity and thinking the more I trained, the more muscle I'd put on. I'll never forget switching to a three day a week program. And it was a hard transition because I was like, this just doesn't feel like I'm putting enough work in, but then my body started to pack on muscle, and that's all I needed. I needed to actually lay off a bit, um, and 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 just follow good programming and eat and recover. And I started I started to see myself put on a lot more size after I'd already been training for over a decade. So you may be in a similar situation, been training as long as you have. You're still young. You probably you want to get after it, and honestly, scaling back a little bit and only training three ta- three times a week. Uh, may do you really well. So, and then what's great about that too is that also leaves us a lot of room to add a, into your cut, right? So, just once, to burn calories. Yeah. So when we get into the cutting phase, it ain't about packing on any more muscle. It's about maintaining the muscle that you work so hard for and moving more and burning more. Uh, and I would that's I would use those extra days to get you more active and 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 burning more calories when we get into our cut phase. Right on. All right. Um, so quick. Do you have any like small checklist of things that you would do outside of like nutrition, sleep, and exercise to kind of try to optimize gains? Outside of sleep, exercise, and nutrition, I mean steroids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm being honest. What yeah, I would do well, this is if no. you're asking my personal what I would be doing. Yeah. That's what I would be doing. Yeah, if you've never, yeah, I, I suggest you find you know, that on your own. Don't go that route. But it, but and if you do, it's going to be hard to come back from. But not, okay. So all joking aside, stress. Um, and then supplements can help. Creatine is going to be probably the most uh, beneficial yeah. supplement that you can take. And if you're not hitting your protein targets with your food, you could supplement with protein powder. But aside from what you just said, there's really not much else. Um, I mean, you could, I, to optimize. I mean, I assume that, yeah, that's the cornerstone. And then just if there was any other like small little tidbits that maybe I could add. But yeah. yeah stress, I mean, pretty, ma- manage yeah, stress. That's I mean, what, yeah, manage stress. Pay attention to what your, your, your stress levels and sleep looks like. If you're if you're uh, if you're not optimizing sleep, that's a that's one of those things that when you're in tw- you're 20, you tend to overlook. And well, he I, included that. He said sleep, training, and nutrition. Yeah. Aside of outside of those, those I would the, say just stress. You know. Yeah. I can't think of anything. Yeah, else. The only thing I'm sad about is actually um, through you guys, I I got an Uller unit, but it started leaking, so I had to send it away. So my sleep has been less restful lately. Oh, okay. But. Well, when you get it back, um, yeah. it'll make a difference, definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thanks for calling in. All right, yeah, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I know I've said this many times, but there's a difference between how much training you can tolerate and how much training, you know, what the appropriate, most effective amount of training is, right? Yeah. Those are two different things. You can almost always tolerate more training than what is considered optimal. And once you go outside of optimal, whether you go below or above optimal, <laughs> You're getting, you're slowing down your progress. You're not going to get as many gains. Okay, so, mm-hmm. so, and what we tend to do, especially when we're very experienced and we're training for a long time and we love the process, is we tend to all inch towards what we can tolerate. Oh, I can do more. Oh, it's not affecting me negatively. Oh, I can do more. Oh, it's not. But without realizing that you're actually reducing your body's ability to, you know, build muscle and improve. So that's that's the part well, that I because most on. instances you you provide more work. A lot of times you get a lot more benefit that way. Yeah. So this is why this is a little bit of a challenge mentally uh, to to scale and find that that sweet spot where you're actually going to move forward. I think that's great advice because he's he's at that age when this is. M- most likely, right? I remember, I remember being ten years deep into training and stuff, and like that was in the heart of yeah. More is more, more is better, mm-hmm. more intense is better, and you can handle a lot when you yeah. Too, and so. it, it was right around, it was maybe a little bit before twenty eight, so I was probably like twenty six uh, when I did that. Like cut, I never my literally from seventeen when I started lifting to probably twenty six, so nine years or so, nine ten years. Um, seven days a week, yeah. you know, and a bad week. And only if I did five, it was because I couldn't get to it or I was doing something like snowboarding or wakeboarding, something else on that day. So I was so active 
and thinking that the more effort, more work I put in, the more muscle I would get. And I remember like, I can't remember what's, what it was that I read. And it was like, I backed off to three days a week and it was hard. I remember thinking like, oh, this isn't working like right, right away. Cause you're not, you're not pumped. You're not up. getting the pump every yeah, day. You're not getting pumped every day. So you're like, oh, I'm shrinking. I'm going to get bad. I'm like, no, I'm going to stay the course, trust the process for like a month. And it was pretty quick after about a month or so I noticed strength. And that's what really started me. Oh, let me hang here for a little. I remember hitting like dumbbell bench press, bigger numbers than I'd ever yeah, hit within before. a couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so I was like, okay, let me let me stick this out for a little bit. So he's probably right in that age where it's he's yeah. still at that. Well, I want to do more. My story's a little different in that I read uh, Mike Mentzer's heavy duty book. Dorian Yates was the reigning Mister Olympia. He talked about overtraining all the time, and so I went high volume and I brought the volume way down and the frequency down, and I saw great gains. I still, still would consistently inch towards that, doing as much as I could tolerate. That's how insidious that tendency is. So check it. And here's, the, okay, always do this. What This is what helps me out. I always ask myself, what's the worst that could happen, right? So I'll cut down. I just recently did this. So I, I cut down my volume. I said, all right, what's the worst that could happen? After a few weeks, I notice it's not working. I go back to what I was doing before and I'll bounce back real quick. So let me give it a few weeks. And uh, you know, like clockwork, uh, less work worked better for me. So- yeah. It's very insidious, so consider that if you're in a you, similar situation. You know, something I didn't tell him to do that I did, um, that I remember I was, a lot of my peers were kind of criticizing it. I thought it was it, they, interesting that they thought this would, they were, they encouraged me to like get on stage right away. Like, oh, and I get why, because they're like, get the nerves out, see what it's like, just who cares what you look like, yeah. just do the next show you can get on to. And I didn't, I wanted to win. Like, so I was like, I'm not ready. You know, I need to prepare so I spent a year of practicing cutting for a show before I cut for my first show because a lot of uh, competing is timing. It's learning learning how to manage your calories and your 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 burn and intake and then how to manipulate that to get your body to peak on a day. It's a lot more than you think it is. Oh, like, it's weird. Like you get when you it's you know what it is? It's when you get really lean. You know, when you're like 10%, 9%, you look good at the beach. You know, holding a couple pounds of water whether or not your muscles have glycogen or not, eh, you can tell, but not really. You're down to 3% body fat on stage. A little bit of water, a little bit of a lack of fullness in your muscles, you look like a different person. And you'll see people the day before, the day after, look way better because they missed their timing. Oh, I, I mean, so that's, I mean, what you're saying is like so on point. I think people have no idea. They don't realize that when you compete, it's not just about all the basics. You got to know all that stuff, but it's like, how do I time this? And not just for the day, by the way. Literally for the morning when I'm doing the prejudging or yeah. when I'm doing it's it's so. I mean, I, I practiced for a year and then I went and did six shows over the course of two years, and I tell people that I don't think I ever brought my best physique to stage. Mm. I always looked better the day before, the day after, the night of. I just it's hard. It's really hard to and if you're constantly building and you're manipulating, changing things, yeah. it's very inconsistent, and so it's tough to peak. Um, right at that time when you're supposed to. So I encourage somebody who's thinking about competing to do a dry run when you don't have to get on stage with like that and just say, hey, I'm going to yeah. try and get the leanest I've ever got. I'm going to try and get my physique and pick a date and say, I'm going to try and get perfectly shredded at this time and see what happens. And what you'll find is I bet you two days before or two days after or the day before or after you find that your physique ends up looking better and you learn a lot about how your body responds to all those little subtle things you're talking about. Our next caller is Austin from Utah. What's up, Austin? How can we help you? Hey, uh, first off, I've been listening to your podcast for just a few months. I probably listen to an episode a day. I, I love you guys. I'm grateful for all the information you give. And Thank you. Um, my question is, uh, about three years ago, I snapped my leg in half in a side-by-side -side accident. Uh, it was a tib-fib compound fracture. And the first surgery actually yielded little to no bone growth. Um, so I went in for a second surgery, meaning that I was basically sedentary on my right leg for almost a year. Uh, I recently got back into lifting heavy again about a year ago. And I just got my body composition tested with an in-body scanner. I don't know how super accurate that is, but... It said that my right leg, the one that I broke, actually has four pounds more muscle than my left leg. Um, and I'm kind of wondering if this is something that's just like overcompensation initially from the, the surgery or 
if it's something that I need to worry about and train specifically to fix. Okay. No, that's a good. That's a good question. That's kind of weird. The um, broken one has more yeah, muscle. The broken that's, one, that's according to in-body scan. Yeah. Let me ask you a couple more questions. Yeah. How is your circulation in the leg that was broken? Does it feel? You got good circulation. Is there any swelling? Anything like that? Uh, no, it feels it feels pretty much normal. Okay. Um, the only thing that's different is I think it's my fibula, the one, the bone at the back. It never actually connected. Oh, okay. So, okay. like the doctor says, it's not a big problem, and I don't feel it. But mm. you know, okay. Now, now the okay. So when we're talking about the difference in muscle, he's saying right now, and he it's the one that was broken three years ago. The one that's, that's, that was broken has four has pounds more muscle. More so muscle. that's not uncommon at all. Yes. So what's actually very common is what happens is when we rehab, uh, and this has happened, this, they've, they've actually done studies to show this. Like a lot of times what ends up happening is people end up, because they're so focused on rehabbing, they've never been that connected to that limb before, and they end up building more muscle on that. Well, so, so here's- It the, comes back sometimes stronger. Yeah, I mean. but I need more, we, we need more info, Austin, because- I wouldn't rely entirely on an in-body yeah. scan. Are you stronger? Okay. On, does exactly. That, Are you more stable now? Like, what's the difference between yeah, both sides that you know as personally? Yeah, is, is the right leg stronger than the left leg? Does it feel more stable? Does it feel more explosive? Uh, yes. I, I think I can genuine, generally feel a little bit stronger in my right leg. Um, it's, it's not a big difference, and it is my dominant leg, so okay. I, I don't know. That's also... Okay. Helping well, that. okay. So nonetheless, uh, regardless of which leg was more muscular or stronger, I would put you, I would have you do unilateral training almost yeah, entirely all, all day. Yeah. For, for like a year. And what I would have you do is start your workout or your exercise with the weaker leg. So don't worry about right leg, left leg, whichever leg is weaker, start okay. your set with that leg and then match that rep range and that weight with the stronger leg. So in other words, you may be doing less then you know, then optimal for the stronger leg because you're trying to get the weaker leg to catch up, yeah. and that'll take that'll happen very quickly. And then I would stick to unilateral training for a while, six months, maybe a year, and then reintroduce okay. uh, yeah. bilateral. Otherwise, exercises. you're going to be running into asymmetry, and there's going to be you yeah. know like uh, things, uh, compensations, and things that you're going to have to account for down the road up the kinetic chain. So it's just better to really focus on that now while you have the opportunity. Uh, to, to really bring them both up to speed. Yeah, so, so here's some good exercises, okay? You could do uh, single leg step-ups. You could do lunges, although lunges are still kind of bilateral. They're, they're split stance, so it's more, it's kind of got that unilateral sense. You could do Bulgarian split stance squats and then uh, driving the sled. I, if I were you, I would do some sled driving most days. So regardless if you're working upper body or different, different body parts, a couple sets, two or three sets, of driving a sled across some grass or across some pavement because it's really, really good for function. It'll help balance out your body, and, and you should be able to notice a difference. But all okay. the training I would do if I were you would be unilateral at this point. Yeah, I don't have much to add to that. I might uh, add a stability component to like uh, my hips and stuff, so mm -hmm. I like single leg toe touch uh, yeah, added mm -hmm. to that, um, and then maybe single leg leg press. Um, but I, the only, what I do want to tell you is that I, it's actually not as uncommon as you, you think, may think, um, this happened to me. So when I tore my, was it because you weren't training both legs and then you rehab well, one? So just what hyper focused on that? No, is yeah. what that's. So my dominant leg used to always be my right leg. Mm. I, I tore my ACL and MCL in my, in my left knee. But when I rehabbed, I was so focused on rehabbing that left side that it actually, so, and before that I was a lot of, I was doing a lot of, you know, bilateral stuff. I wasn't doing yeah. a lot of unilateral stuff. But when I was rehabbing, I was doing a lot of unilateral stuff. I had to really focus on that right. one side. So what I attributed it to was in the past when I would squat or do leg press or these exercises for my legs, my dominant leg would carry most of mm -hmm. the load. But then when I had to rehab, I was doing a lot of unilateral stuff. I had to focus on rehabbing that leg, got really good and connected to it. And then when I went back to doing bilateral stuff, that leg was now becoming my dominant, dominant leg. Yeah, and I just had never put enough emphasis on on the weaker side uh, of, of unilateral trading. And so now that my my surgery side is my dominant, stronger side, it's really interesting that that happened. But I, I remember during that time trying to piece it together myself. And I, I remember reading articles around put this being common because someone gets hurt and especially athletes because and, and you're I, so focused yes because yeah. you're so focused on rehabbing that, yeah, that it's that that single leg had never got that single leg attempt i was doing balancing stuff or you know to the very beginning you're doing a lot of stability balance a lot of con mind muscle connection stuff to that that injury side and i just had never given that attention to the weaker leg 
before and then that carried over into my training when I got back. Yeah. So one other thing, Austin, I, I'm I'm not a doctor, but if but you said your fibia never fully connected. Uh yeah. Okay. I would I would get another opinion. I, I, it just doesn't that doesn't okay. sound right to me that that's okay. Now maybe it's being communicated wrong or maybe I obviously I don't know the whole picture. Again, I'm not a doctor. But if I had okay. a bone that didn't reconnect, uh, I would. I'd be a little concerned. Yeah, I'd want to go get another okay. opinion and say, okay, what's the deal here? Because I've had clients with a torn ACL, and the doctor's like, eh, it's no big deal because you don't play sports, you don't really need an ACL. I'm like, uh, not, <laughs> I don't think that's optimal. Yeah. Let's get that reconnection. Okay. So yeah, I would get a second opinion just to see what's going on. And um, do you have uh, Maps Prime Pro? Because I think that'll really benefit you. I don't. All right, we'll send that over to you, Austin. Oh, thank you so much. No I problem. appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for calling in. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, what you're saying makes sense because uh, it's like you you put hyper focus on rehab and you're not doing anything for the strong leg because you're not you're thinking oh it's okay, right. and then you surpass whatever yeah. before. But you know, with unilateral training, it's really remarkable how quickly you start to balance things out and get stronger. Within a few months, you start to really get good. I remember um, watching Paul Check. So he's a good friend of ours, right? He's a wellness guru. And he's an older gentleman. He's got to be almost 60 now. Very strong, very muscular. This guy's a, a, he's a phenom. And I remember watching him do walking lunges. Mm -hmm. And Paul loves unilateral exercises. He does tons of unilateral exercises for his lower body. This guy was doing, and you're talking about a body weight of 160 pounds, 170 lean, right? Walking lunges with 275, which is insane yeah. because he got good at them because he always did unilateral training. So you can get really, really strong with unilateral training and really develop good symmetry and balance well, in the there's, body. Well, there's a lot of coaches, actually. There's camps here uh, that um, – it's Mike Boyle who's famous for this, mm -hmm. right, who's like – what doesn't do anything bilateral. Everything is unilateral because we walk and run. When you think about it, yeah. walking and running is unilateral. It's not bilateral. So if if we walk and run like that, why wouldn't we train our bodies that way? So they make a good case for it. Yeah. Um, and I, there's value in both. There is. I, I can I'm, definitely see more value in unilateral training for athletes for sure, though. Yeah. yeah. For sure. I see there's a lot of value. But general strength and power, especially if I'm training a newer athlete, um, I know we're kind of going off on, on a tangent, but I think this is a great topic. If I'm training a younger athlete and I'm trying to build general strength, then I'll do more maybe bilateral stuff unless there's some imbalances. As they get more advanced, then I think it makes more sense to go more specific unilateral type stuff, you know, because there's more carryover in that. You got to build case. that foundational base. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then the unilateral really makes sense from there for them to be able to stabilize properly and generate force in a split stance position. Our next caller is Gonzalo from Alabama. Gonzalo, what's going on? How can we help you? Hey, hello, team. Uh, first of all, incredible uh, to actually meet the four of you. So, so thank you, thank you so much um, uh, for taking uh, the time uh, for the question. So, um, real, uh, real quick, I'm hoping to uh, get some advice since the three of you are experts and your parents. So, hopefully, you can you can help me out here. So long story short, um, recently in the last couple of years, I transformed myself, lost 85 pounds, got in shape, nice. figured out some fitness stuff. Uh, I've been working with uh, uh, my wife and we have three children. Uh, my two boys uh, also, uh, they, they, become, they are athletic and they've become even more so after the transformation. So um, I'm very comfortable with uh, you know what to do with them. Uh, and so forth. They're they're a little bit older. Uh, my wife recently just got match resistance for her. She's joining the bandwagon. So we're basically uh, we're turning nice. into a mind pump family. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. But my daughter, who is eleven, has been asking how can she get in better shape? How can she uh, like me when I was younger? Uh, she has a bit of a. She's starting to uh, develop perhaps a little bit of a. a, a weight issue she's concerned she wants to improve her health let's put it there uh and she's a cheerleader so um from what i've learned from you guys of course nutrition um that is is pretty clear it seems to me like the advice holds even for an 11 year old you know water whole foods etc sleep rest but how do you is resistance training something an 11 year old girl should do and if so what does that look like? And that's where I wanted to uh, 
uh, to get your advice. Yeah, I think we should start with um, one. I would, I would, I would definitely make sure that I help shift her mindset to being strong. Right, like I, what I don't want to do with her is I don't want to make it about um, anything to do with her weight. Even if you believe that we, we need to bring her weight down a little bit, like I don't want to, I mean, make sure we don't communicate that. And it's around her being strong and healthy and a strong woman and empowering her like that. Um, I definitely would want to say that. But there's a lot of, I mean, uh, MAPS Anywhere, MAPS Suspension, uh, MAPS Starter, Starter, all mm-hmm. three great programs um, that she could potentially do. I also, um, I also would look for things. I think about this stuff as a dad now, right? Like I know that there's potential that I could be in a very similar situation. And what if my son isn't really into lifting weights or exercising? Like I'd also find ways to just to be active with her and to have fun. You know, does, does she like to swim? Does she like to ride her bike? Like, um, and now that you've, you've made this, you know, transition into a much healthier lifestyle is finding ways to just, uh, have fun with activity and keeping her moving, um, more so than really trying to force her into like a, a, a weightlifting routine if she's not really into it. Now, if she's really into it, like if you teach her one of those three programs and she's all about it, then by all means, have fun with it and, 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 and train her on those routines. Um, but I, I think I would be more about just being active with her and doing stuff. That would be the way I would in her, introduce her into like fitness that that's my opinion. Yeah, I really like map suspension only because um, you know the, the the main things initially with you know kids that age and what I experienced too with my son who's eleven is just body control, body awareness, and strength stability. So uh, you know, in terms of like you know adding resistance with with dumbbells or you know add it, like I think that that's great, but I think a good first start starting step would be, you know, body weight training and, and with the suspension, it just really helps to kind of, um, guide that in a very succinct way. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's, it's something that's not, not too much in ter- in terms of like overwhelming her with exercises and things, um, that might be not that familiar. It kind of simplifies the whole process a bit. And so I, I just like to kind of start there and see, you know, like what kind of response you get and just to try and as much as you can to have fun with her in that process. Yeah. Gonzalo, resistance training is appropriate for for anybody. It's just how it's applied. Okay. Right. It's really about how it's being applied. So if you got a real young kid, resistance mm-hmm. training looks like gymnastics, looks like body weight, yep. you know, exercises or even games. Yeah, play. As they get older, it could be more like traditional resistance training. The things to focus on with your 11-year-old are stability and balance, right? So if she can if she can push, let's say she could lift a 5-pound dumbbell above yeah. her head. Um, but you notice at the top, and it's very common for a kid, they'll lift something, they have the strength to lift, but they don't have the stability, and you'll see it kind of wobble and move all over the place. Go go way lighter. You want to go way lighter and focus more on can they do this without wobbling and without being unstable. But other than that, all exercises, so long as they're applied appropriately, are fine. They're not only fine, but she'll benefit uh, tremendously from them. And I want to go back to what Adam said. I would focus entirely on performance. How many reps you did? How strong do you feel? How's your energy? I would not focus on anything that has to do with appearance, especially for an 11 year old girl, because she's gonna right. she's gonna get to the age where she's gonna become more self conscious anyway. And if the focus is placed on appearance, then there's a higher chance that there could be like a dysfunctional relationship with with exercise and that. But it sounds like you're doing a great job. You've already led by example. Right. It sounds like the whole family is following along. So I, I'll tell you what, you know, this is great. And this, I, you know, I wish my kids let me do this. Um, I tried doing this, so it doesn't always work. But if your kids are into it, mm-hmm. a family workout day, man, what a dream. Like everybody goes out in the garage and we all have a good time. We play music and we do exercises. And, you know, it's not really about you training yourself too hard, but it's more about everybody enjoying themselves and creating a good environment. Um, but, you know, resistance training for 11-year-old, two days a week is plenty. Really, two days a week is is plenty so long as she's active otherwise. Pushing a sled would be cool too yeah. if you had access to something. Sleds or kids love that. Love, love Do you it. have um, MAP suspension? I know Justin was talking about that. I think that's a good yeah. a good program. Do you we, have that? We, uh, uh, we do not. Our, our first product, product is uh, MAPS resistance uh, for the wife. So we do not. Um, so yeah, the, yeah. 
that would be that would be great. Yeah, we'll that would be great. Mike. We'll send that over to you, so you'll have yeah, access to that. You. And uh, then all you need to do is get suspension trainers. You can get them relatively inexpensive. I know you can go on our site, and we sell them for a pretty good price. I think it's at mindpumpstore.com, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Um, but yeah, we'll give you the program for free, and and then let us know what happens. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you were talking about the family, uh, what is the family workout day? Yeah. So my middle son is a competitive rock climber. Oh, wow. So so we do have access. We usually all go to the gym and that is one activity that she does enjoy also. Awesome. There you go. That's, perfect. That's perfect. That's yeah, it right there. Yeah, she'll do well. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and, yeah and, oh, goodness. Well, thank you so much for the advice. No problem. Thank you. All right. Great show, guys. Keep it going. Thank, thank you. Amazing thank you. content. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the whole thing with kids is what a great uh, story, you know. It is, and you know what's funny with kids? It's like uh, when you when you talk to people that that, that are like experts in what do they call it, child led learning. Mm. When you have you see this as a parent, when your child is into something, they will learn everything about it. They'll become obsessed. They'll just eagerly eagerly learn and absorb information. When they're not into something, you try to it's force like pulling it. Teeth. Yeah, actually, it's yeah. worse. And that's so, why. I, that's why I was kind of alluding to yeah. that, right? Like, find out if she likes to bike. Does she like to swim? Yeah. Does she? Is she into gymnastics? Like, you yeah. find something that she's physically into already, mm -hmm. and just have fun with it. Yep. Keep her active and, and, and encourage it and incorporate it into your guys's training days. Versus, like, because I do get questions like this a lot. Like, you know, what should I train my kid on? It's like, well. If you have an 11 year old that is like wanting to lift weights, well, that's exciting, you know. Like, but I know it's rare. Yeah, it was very rare. Like, most kids are not into it the same way. And instead of trying to force it and make them train that way, it's find ways to 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 keep them active and to play and enjoy just movement. Yeah. I think that's the the play at that age. And he's already doing the most important thing. He's leading by example. Yeah, that's that's the biggest and thing. That, and the whole family. That's right. It. And and there's going to come a day where she's going to remember that that my dad was had all this weight and got down to this weight and he's healthier and he's he's more fun to be around. She's going to connect those dots and there's a very good chance that she'll come to him when she wants to do resistance training and do those things for now, yeah. I'm just, but it, it is, it is rare for a kid to want to do resistance. Training. Very rare. Yeah, yeah. I'd say the, if the average age of a kid getting into it is late teens, mm -hmm. early twenties, you know, yeah. when they're, when they really are like, want to change how they look. Otherwise a little more self-conscious. Yeah. I've trained a lot of kids. It's boring for kids like yeah. reps. What the hell am I? You know, I'd want to go, let me go throw something or do right. something more. That's why the sled's kind of cool, right? Like kids love the sled. Like, yeah, I would totally yeah. take a sled out and you know challenge how far we could push it, and make a game out of yeah. it. Yeah, medicine know? ball stuff is always great. Yeah, can you throw this. Yeah, can yeah. You lift this. I'm all about climbing. Any kind of thing they can climb on. You can like the trampolines, amazing. So yeah. there's lots of options there. It just makes it more of a fun environment. Our next caller is April from Michigan. April, what's going down? How can we help hey, you? Hey, hi guys. Hey, hi. Um, <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome to the mail truck. <laughs> um, so uh, I guess my question uh, is I'm, I'm in mail care. Obviously, um, I am um, super active. I have a walking route, so I do about 10 plus miles a day, um, depending on the mail volume. And I'm currently doing maps in anabol a anabolic. Um, and I'm just kind of I'm just I'm a recovering uh, boot camp classer. Hmm. Um, and I'm just kind of trying to figure out if I am, um, in the right program, if I, um, should be focusing more on like performance or just kind of trying to make my job a little easier because I, I was doing those boot camp classes and I started listening to you guys and I stopped doing those because I was like, why am I so tired all the time? Yeah. Well, it's because you have a job that's very demanding and then you're doing a boot camp class literally every day and twice on Sunday. Wow. All right. Well, I, <laughs> so you're in the right, you're in the right place now. Yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is, a, this is okay. a relatively easy a a question to answer, but it's a very common question. So I'm going to ask okay. you a few more questions. Okay. Yeah. Ha what have you noticed, uh, since you started maps anabolic, have you improved your strength? Uh, do you feel like you're building muscle? Do you feel like you're oh, getting yeah. more fit? So let me yeah, break it down for me. What have you seen since you've started it? Um, well, I, I mean, I, I have a, a training background. I've never actually trained anybody, but I went to school to be a trainer. So I ha I do have some um, knowledge. So I did used to lift weights. Uh, so I have noticed, obviously, like my muscle coming back very quickly. 
um, which is awesome. But I do still struggle with like imbalances because with this job, um, we carry a, a mail bag on our shoulder on the same shoulder pretty much every day. And I have noticed um, that like one si one of my legs is stronger than the other. I don't know if that is due to that weight bearing down on my one mm -hmm. side the whole th mm -hmm. um, time I'm carrying mail. Could be. Um, so yeah, so that that's something that I'm um, trying to like switch up. I try to do some more unilateral stuff. Okay. Um, Perfect. But you but you are getting stronger and you aren't noticing improvements in performance while doing maps anabolic. Yes, definitely. Okay. But um, I would go I would go maps performance after you finish maps anabolic. Go maps performance. It's really good. Mm -hmm. But what she's doing right okay. now is great. What you're doing is smart. It's yeah. actually perfect, uh, in my opinion. I think maps anabolic it, for, uh, metabolism wise from what you were doing before with the everyday boot camp twice on the weekends, like the perfect yeah. thing for your body it's a good would shift for your body yeah is to go to anabolic and then okay. what you're doing is actually really smart you're this is where we always tell people right like our, our programs aren't perfect for everybody the idea is that you take the base and then you modify some things for yourself perfect example of what you just said is i notice i have this discrepancy from left to right in my legs mm -hmm. so hey maybe instead of always doing back loaded or front uh, front loaded squats where you're bilateral do some unilateral work you know do some lunging instead or bulgarian split squats or single leg leg press um, instead of that movement, and I think that is a great yeah. uh, a great thing right there. What now you're I'm going to make an assumption, uh, and you tell me if I'm right or wrong, but uh, mm -hmm. do your calves dwarf Adam and Sal's? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, uh, no, they're probably magnificent. No comment. Probably. That's the right answer. Uh, no comment. Just say, no let's comment. just put that out. If you there, want a free all. program, make sure yeah, you answer. Yeah, this yeah, yeah. I'm the one who gives out free programs over here, so just be no, careful. So, you know what, though? Uh, another thing, April, um, you in your question that you sent us, you, you, you did, there was a body fat percentage question you asked as well about getting leaner. That's almost entirely yeah. that's almost entirely a diet thing. Okay. So if you're getting stronger, yes. yeah. you're building muscle, yeah. it's a diet thing. So that's gonna be about okay. nutrition. And then I do want to comment on how you hold your bag while you're yeah. you're, you're delivering mail. I mm -hmm. would start to very slowly, okay, that's in bold letters, very slowly okay. switch the bag every once in a while. Don't don't go crazy yeah. and do yeah. half of your route with it on the other shoulder because it will hurt. Mm -hmm. You're not used to it. But I would okay. do like you know, let's say you're doing 10 miles uh, and it's mm -hmm. and the bag is always over one side. I would do one yeah. mile with the bag over the other side and then do nine like you normally yeah. do. And slowly, yeah, but slowly but surely work it up to where you can. It might take you like, how long have you been a mail carrier for? Um, I'm about three years. Okay. I would give it like a year before you do, before it's equal on either side. Okay. So slowly do okay. it because you're so accustomed to one side that if you go five miles with the bag on the other shoulder, you're not going to feel very good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do try to do that on it. The only um, problem with that is that when we carry mail, all of our stuff is in one arm. So you only have one arm available to you to pull out of the bag. And it's like trying to carry mail in the other hand is kind of like trying to right with your left hand if you're right-handed mm, yeah. it's, it's uh, a yeah. little tricky yeah it's so it's, i it's hard but um yeah i'm gonna i mean okay you've only done this for three years you already noted uh, mm -hmm. notice a difference if you plan on yeah, doing this for I, a long exactly. time yeah i would do it because yeah. you're gonna see i mean the imbalance can get yeah. i mean over the years over 10 years 15 years it's if gonna you plan compile on, it'll compile and it'll be really hard to reverse with exercise because you do you do this so so often that yes. you know two or three days a week of training even five days a week of training to try to balance it out. You're never really going to catch up. So I would start now. It's a pain in the butt. Okay. It'll take you a while. It'll take you probably a year or longer to feel comfortable on one side. So do it really slow. There's no there's no time limit here. Just do it really slow. Get to the point where you can you know, do both sides and feel okay on both sides because uh, over the years, this is going to become more, more of an issue. Okay. And uh, is there anything as far as like, should I, on my um, trigger session d days, should I be focusing more on unilateral? Like, yeah, uh, I think that'd okay. be smart. Yeah, that's, like, that's smart. Focus heavy on that. Yep, yep. I don't know if you guys noticed, but I have my, um, I have a little cage here and I have my uh, revision assistance band. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Only you got to do what you got to do when you're working 12 hour shifts. That's that's super <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So no, no. Yeah. Do what we said. Do you have mass performance by the way? Cause I'll send that to you. 
I do not. That would be awesome. Thank right. you so much. We'll send that over to you. Now, one more favor. If you can look into this, Adam ordered, ordered a penis enlarger. Never got it. See if it got lost in the mail. <laughs> Schaefer. <laughs> so now it got lost. You know, yeah. they actually do that. Do you know that they actually have that where you can order and then it requires us to get a signature for it? So it's wow. like a, embarrassing for both parties. It's hilarious. Wow. So the box, the box will just have yeah. like, they don't, it's like, it's, it's honestly pump, not the real thing. So it's a gag. Wow. It's no, hilarious. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they make a fortune I'm on I'm it. totally joking. He got it. He didn't, it wasn't lost in the middle. <laughs> anyway, th good, thank good. you so good. much, April. Thank good you, April. Right. <laughs> thank you, guys. Have a good one. No problem. Yeah, I, I guess the rule of thumb is this. If you're wondering if it's working, are you, are you getting stronger and more fit? The answer is yes. Yeah. Because yeah. I think a lot of people are like, oh, my God, is this the right program? And then you ask them, are you stronger? Well, yeah, I added 15 well, pounds yeah, to my... That's, you know. that's well, happening. What do you think? You know, yes, it, it is I, I like your guys' advice right of switching, uh, switching hands and stuff like that. Yeah. And even though it's difficult for her to do it, the, I think it'll be benefit. You know what it reminded me of right away? So when I was in high school, I remember my freshman coach uh, was giving me a hard... I was left, I'm left-handed. So I had a tendency to always drive with my left hand and like he was like getting on to me saying like this will be your Achilles heel. This will keep you from being a starter if you can't get your right hand to be as dominant as your left hand. Mm. So I remember like of course at home I'm playing with dribbling with my right hand all the time but then I also started to eat with the opposite hand and brush my teeth with the opposite hand like Now you're ambidextrous. Right. So yeah. I and I kind of am, right? I'm not quite all the way there, but it made a huge difference by but, and it was trust me it was frustrating, yeah. you know, eating with the and brushing your teeth. It felt really really awkward at the beginning, but you'd be surprised how quick the body starts to figure it out. Like you stick to it long enough. Well, bro, back in the day yeah. Uh, might even have been as recent as when Doug was a kid. That's if you were left, it's not recent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Back when he went to school with Moses. No. Yeah. Um, no, back in the day, and again, it might not have been that long ago. And I, I would love to hear Doug's opinion on this. If you were left-handed, the teachers in school made you yeah, the, do everything the, the with correct. your right. Yeah, when they you know, slap that hand, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. no, they would just. It's no, you can't write with your left. That's wrong. You got to do it with your right. And then the kids would learn, and yeah. they'd be totally fine. It's like you're possessed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Did that happen when you were a kid? Or I did... don't recall that. Okay. No. However, like scissors and things were always an issue for these kids because yeah. there wasn't oh, yeah. anything scissors for them. Was a real problem. But yeah. my pet pterodactyl, though, was uh, <laughs> left, left clawed and didn't have any issues. He wrote, he wrote it to school. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, look, if you like our information, you got to head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any fitness goal. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. 